Oh, there's one. Okay. It's a long 30 seconds. All right. Okay, the light is on, so we're going to um, get started here, folks, and I'll call the meeting to order and welcome everyone this evening. Would you like to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Mary, could we get a roll call, please? Olson? Here. Sykes? Yo. Johnson? Here. Kellum? Here. Kopsinski? Here. Coburn? Here. Okay, and first on our agenda this evening is we do have a couple presentations. And the first one is Lynn County Mental Health Advisory Board. And um, Dick Knowles, uh, would you like to come forward? And then if the, make sure the microphone picks you up there also, Dick. You might want to even hold it if that makes it easier for you, whichever you'd prefer. Okay. All right. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Dick Knowles. Um, I'm actually from Sweet Home, but I'm the chair of the Mental Health Advisory Board for Lynn County. Um, I think it was about two months ago the, uh, the mayor read a mental health proclamation, and due to some exchanges of emails, it got puzzling more diffuse the longer we talked to each other. Uh, I didn't make it to the meeting that that was presented at. So we spent the last two months trying to get me here. Um, the Mental Health Advisory Board over the last three or four years has been going out to each of the cities in the county uh, to try to get as many folks involved in mental health and the various activities in the county. We use May because it's Mental Health Month kind of federally. Um, and one of our reasonings is that, and with no offense to this astute body or the city, uh, those of us who live in Sweet Home notice that an awful lot of things happen in Albany, uh, and it sometimes feels like you get forgotten when you live out in other places. So we have tasked ourselves to visit each of the 10, basically 10 cities, uh, in the county. I've now been to nine of the ten. Uh, one of them is just a little odd. Um, no offense to them at all. Um, and we like to do uh, kind of a brief overview of what's going to happen in May. Obviously it's now June, so this is a little odd. Much of what we've done, well actually all of what we've done except for this presentation has been done. Uh, I'll very quickly just let you know that we do events at Lynn Benton Community College. We do events at the uh, med school in Lebanon. Uh, that was the first that they've done something uh, actually at all, and we were part of it, went very well. Um, we also do a fair amount uh, with the other community organizations. Um, and again, by going out into the, um, the various other cities, uh, we try to get folks to acknowledge that there are ways to get yourself services. Part of what we've done is we've collaborated with uh, alcohol and drug, um, uh, other county organizations. Um, have developed, uh, they have developed and we market uh, mental health first aid, uh, which is presented throughout the county. Um, some of you may actually be aware of some of that. Um, but the notion being that uh, mental health issues happen to everyone. It depends on the numbers you look at. One of four, one of five families, uh, individuals have some connection to a mental health issue. And it doesn't make any difference where you live, what your economic status is, whatever. It's going to impact you. Um, and one of the ways you deal with that is to try to do some kind of what is called first aid. It looks like a, um, 
uh, medical first aid only toward, uh, geared towards mental health issues. Um, not trying to make anybody a counselor, not trying to make anybody a professional, um, just making you sensitive that there are folks out there that really could use some help. Um, and then we also have shown a couple of movies. Actually, I bumped into a couple of folks who were aware of it. I don't think I saw them at the movies. Um, it, May is a very busy month for the Mental Health Advisory Board. And I have to say, just because it's nice to say, it's a very unusual board, uh, probably statewide. There's only three or four other boards county boards that get this involved in community exercises. And each year we have, uh, we've uh, extended what we do in the community. Uh, what, I, what I brought, uh, I would, except for the kind of austere nature of the group, what I brought are five table tents, which we've developed. Um, these go, uh, uh, you may have seen them around the community actually. We have them in the library here in Albany, uh, Samaritan Health uh, does uh, uh, presentations that involved uh, and that we've been involved in. Uh, these are based uh, for, the, for the community. Uh, these are based on myths and, and facts about mental health. Just for example, uh, the, one of the myths is there's no hope for people with mental health problems. And the fact is recovery is possible Today, is more, today there is more help available than ever before, and then it gives you uh, a place you can call people that can help various community um, organizations. Each one of these is English and Spanish, depending. There are five different facts and myths. Um, and again, we tend to put them in tables around town. I'll drop them over here and you guys uh, can do what you like afterwards. Um, taken from these, uh, we have developed posters, um, which are like this, excuse the back end, uh, which can be posted around City Hall or other places. We're finding, and I'm getting calls from libraries saying, can you please bring me one? Um, gleaners, places like that around the, the county. These are these are becoming fairly popular, actually. Um, one of the things we've done uh, when I, uh, two years ago now, when I went to the city of Halsey, somebody said, you know, uh, May is also Older Americans Month, and they have mental health issues. And it's one of those things where a guy my age goes, duh. <laughs> um, and we got together as the board uh, and came up with magnets, which actually reflect one of the five table tents. And these are meant to go on people's um, refrigerators in their homes. And we've given them out now to two different Meals on Wheels groups. They deliver these with their uh, meals. And the idea isn't so much to say to mental health, or to say to clients, or the, their clients, that there's anything wrong with them. The teaser usually works that if you're living in next to someone or you know someone of your age that's having some difficulty, this allows you to have a, a, a number that you can call. If your neighbor hasn't been out of the house in four days, if uh, somebody's been wearing the same apron for two months, maybe something isn't quite right. And again, excuse the back end, this allows you something that, oh, I know, I can call this number and somebody can help me. Uh, as it turns out, the best help has been to the actual drivers for Meals on Wheels because I have now been to three different groups, all three of them ending with, I wish you guys had been here before because this happens to us all the time. We run into people who need our help. So I will end with that and struggle with my getting stuff over to the other table. And before I go, we have taken one of the posters and mounted it, and I would like to give it to the mayor. Thank you. Thank you all very much. You guys do good. Thank you.
thank you, Dick. And we really appreciate your service, too. So, I mean, Dick, um, he was um, a part of our 10-year, um, Lynn County 10-year homeless plan, and he's been very involved in Benton Housing Authority over, um, you know, providing affordable housing. So, um, and with the <coughs> mental health community, you are just been wonderful asset and we very much appreciate your your support so yeah thank you dick okay um so next for we do have public hearings which is um, quite a few of them this evening but i don't see anybody that's actually here for the public hearings <coughs> which would be over system development charges or over the budget i'm I think most folks are here probably for a petition, and if so, could you raise your hand? I think that's mostly everyone. Okay, so what I'm going to do is um, we're going to hold off on the public hearing for a bit, so staff, sorry, if that's okay, we can um, go ahead and move the other folks forward. So we're going to go to business from the public, and then the first one is going to be um, the petition to prohibit camping on private property during solar eclipse. So Marilyn, yes, would you like to come forward? And then you'll need to state your name and your address for the record. My name is Marilyn Robinson, and I live at 236 Northwest Dogwood Lane in Albany, Oregon, with my husband and my mother. So I'd like to bring a matter to your attention that's concerning to our very close-knit neighborhood. Our neighbor at 1350 Spring Hill Road has asked for our permission to have a for-profit three-day solar eclipse event on her seven-acre property. In her words, and I quote, the solar eclipse event would be to allow 35 campers to stay at my field for anywhere from one to three days. I would have a licensed security guard who would be on site, armed, end of quote. The owner has advised me that she has contacted the city and is in compliance with all city ordinances. I had a short meeting with Marilyn Smith on May 8th and was informed that according to code 13.36.180, that indeed the property owner was within her rights. As long as she has permission from all adjacent neighbors. So Mrs. Mrs. Morrison has not received positive feedback from the neighbors. So we the neighbors are concerned with probable issues such as fire, sanitation, privacy, crime, noise, alcohol and drug use, odors, barking dogs, and adverse effects with uh, in regards to the environment, should wastewater be disposed from an RV? Also concerned about crowd control and emergency preparedness for this August event. We also believe this event would put an undue burden on public services such as fire and police departments. And this event could get out of control and not be consistent with our neighborhood bucolic characteristics. Fire. On the topic of fire, the field that Mrs. Morrison is referring to is now planted with a grain of some sort. It's beautiful, it's green. However, by August, it's going to be tinder dry. It's not a place to have campers with their campfires. And a side note here, both Dogwood and Shady Lanes, along with Sherwood Place, have no outlet. So if a fire breaks out, people will have to walk out or be carried out through the forested areas that are north and south of that street. Sanitation. Ms. Morris Morrison has yet to secure porta potties for this event, and she doesn't have enough potable water to support 35 campers or possibly 150 people. So we, the concerned citizens, sincerely and respectfully urge the council to halt the neighbor's solar eclipse event on her property at 1350 Spring Hill Road. And now with your permission, I'd like to invite uh, my neighbors to give their comments on this matter. Okay. 
So yeah. I think I, what, just like what we um, heard today was that um, the property owner has withdrawn the request for having the um, solar eclipse event. So we don't know that is as of today. So we don't know if that could change, but that's what we heard. So on that. Well, as the record, we'd like the petition to. It could, so right. Question. Yeah. It, uh -huh. it, it, I wasn't aware of that, so it sounds like a non-issue, but. One of the first things, if I heard you correctly in looking at the copy of the ordinance you provided, that they have to have the permission of the property owners. And, sure. and it's obviously they don't. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I don't understand the issue. Uh, according to your own words, she can't have it. Exactly. So I, I guess I don't understand why according you're here. According to her words, <laughs> to her e through the email that she gave me, that she is uh, being consistent with all of the laws and necessary regulations. Mm -hmm. So I think she said, she said. I, I don't get it. Right. Well, so I think what this really does is this makes it now formal to the record that the neighbors are not in support. So it, instead of he said, she said, from neighbor to neighbor, now it is formal. They have brought it to, you know, to our attention. So and that's on record, and she'll she'll see that too. Are any of these neighbors on the list adjoining to her property? Yes. Could you point them out, maybe? Yes. Mm -hmm. And me. <laughs> yep. Quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. And also, um, you guys are on septic tank, too, right? There is no, um, you know, city sewer that's out that way. So, with that. And fire hydrants, I don't even know where the closest fire hydrant. There's just one. There's one. Where's that located at? It's at the corner of Shady and Dockwood. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there might not even be adequate fire protection. But, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so um, I, I, it's probably not necessary for all the neighbors to um, end up speaking unless you just want to have your, you know, name a part of the record or just a raising of hands, we can acknowledge how many are here, whichever you'd prefer. Is that okay? Um, yes, you may. Okay. Uh huh. Oh, you have to come up. Yeah, oh, yeah. You got to come up I to the. I could. Sure. I have, yeah. I have a couple questions. Yeah. <laughs> You've done this before, Annette. Is this one at work too? Yeah, it's been a long time since I've yes. seen you up here in the. My meetings. name is Annette Simonson, 1240 Northwest Shady Lane. You're probably more familiar um, with other environmental concerns that I've had here in the past. <laughs> Uh, however, my question was, I was under the impression, and this is why we were here, Bill, is that I had, I was under the maybe misimpression that she had obtained a permit from the city of some sort. And that, that was the, um, the main reason. Um, and then, of course, uh, the other thing was that we were not asked permission. It was a notification that she was going to hold the event. And so there wasn't any asking of permission to the neighbors at all. It came in the form of an email notifying uh, surrounding neighbors that um, the event was going to occur. Um, okay. And it was a situation that then caused people to raise their concerns, namely, you know, I mean, the obvious sanitation, you know, and the, the fact that she couldn't rent. Porta potties came up time and time again. I know other people were planning on mentioning this. Uh, because of the solar eclipse and the far in advance uh, need for those kinds of things, they are completely booked out. And so um, the, the neighbor's response was then to say that, well, they can go use Tacana Landings uh, facility or Starbucks. And you've got people there for three days and in the middle of the night and everything. And, you know. Yeah. Okay, so to, to not, you know, beat the thing into the ground, I would like to say for the record, um, Charlene's a very nice lady and uh, has been a good neighbor to everybody, and I don't think anyone has a bone to pick other than bringing up these issues and being very concerned about the fire hazard in a tinder drive, as you put it, August. Um, and I think that speaks, the rest of it speaks for itself. I'm going to turn it over to anyone else. Sorry if the, so the question then, there is no permit? There's no permit. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is that it? Yeah. We the microphone's got to pick you up. Yes, yeah, sorry, <laughs> and you'll have to do your your name and address too. My name is Judy Gardner, and we live uh, 15 feet from 
from Miss Morrison's property, and uh, our address is 1330 Northwest Shady Lane. Um, but I believe that when she first came to visit, this, she did visit the City Hall to expound on her thing. She kind of gave some misinformation, saying that it was going to be a family reunion. Um, and that also that none of the neighbors objected. I have copy of the email that I sent her on uh, April 27th that listed the things that we were concerned about, mostly fire, garbage, noise, sanitation, lack of potable water, um, many of those things. And um, I sent her that email on April 27th and forwarded a copy to uh, people here in the city. So uh, even though there was some mention that we did not object, we certainly do. And I too would question where is the liability insurance if she did decide to do this? You know, we have a $400,000 home next door. Does she have liability insurance that's going to cover me 15 feet away? Um, I think basically that's all I have to say. Thank you. Mayor? Yeah. Uh-huh. Can we just get confirmation from Maryland that in fact these things that are written down here are correct? That the she would have to go to her neighbors and and get that that's the copy of the code that's yeah. included with yeah. this yes and those okay. are my highlights right. on, on okay. the document that well I guess problem solved yeah. thank you very much I, thank I, you. I do I do have to ask right. though since since you I, I inferred from what you said that if it was not an eclipse and she wanted to have a family reunion and had 30 families coming for her family reunion you would be okay with it no <laughs> no, I would not be okay with it because uh, she would still need the standards of sanitation, fire protection, okay. and those things. Okay. No, I mean, if she had a, if she had <clears throat> two or three family members come to her property to have a family reunion, I would assume that she could handle those things in her home, her sanitation or water or whatever. But no, I would object under any circumstance. Okay. And your, your, your street is not brought up to city standards, if I remember right. Yeah, it's not. There's no curb gutter. No, there's anything. not. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and Shady Lane is a private lane. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. it lists, all of Shady Lane is listed as a private lane. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. I did have a question for Sean. Oh. Mm -hmm. Looking at this ordinance, would a person have to comply with one through five or just one? Of, I don't. What are you looking at? No, I don't think I was provided that. I gave mine to Mary. Oh, okay. Yeah. Under the yellow highlight. Okay. You yes, you have to apply with the first four before getting to five. Is that what your question was? Mm -hmm. well, I didn't know if, if, again, if you had to comply with all five uh, of those points or just one. A good example is, you know, you could you could have just comply with number one. You're going to park at an RV park. No, you would need to apply with would comply with all of them. And then, and even then, it's limited unless the unless the uh, city manager approves it would even then be limited to 48 hours and I think we heard testimony tonight that she's talking about up to three days well, so although, this, although this does say recreational vehicles if they came in with a tent and a sleeping bag tent would be different and then we'd have to look at different different parts of the code I just I'm gonna bail Sean out this this is actually it's kind of a tricky question because the, the code really didn't anticipate 
you know, solar eclipses. <laughs> <laughs> and the possibility that someone would try and capitalize within the city limits. And I, I think it might be a good signal for us uh, to look at our codes to do a better job of making sure that we could cover uh, an event where somebody is trying to basically conduct a commercial enterprise inside a residential zone. Uh, we had a meeting today where we were nervous, and I was very happy to hear that um, the lady who had originally <coughs> proposed it decided not to, uh, because I think that bails us out. Uh, we, I mean, there are things that we have in the code that could allow us to address issues like fire hazard, uh, waste disposal, things of that nature that we, would, we could require, but the question of whether or not we could prohibit it is, depends on what the person is actually going to be doing. So we will be watching the situation, and I'm pretty confident that we have enough at our disposal to be able to, to make sure that, uh, that the concerns are addressed and ideally that nothing happens there. So. Mm -hmm. Do you have any street lights that are in the neighborhood? A lot of, lot of folks that are coming into the cities thinking for the eclipse, they, they don't realize once it gets dark, the automatic street lights come on. So. You know how you're downtown, everything's really lit up. So I think a lot of folks, they probably are going to be wanting to go to the rural areas, you know, to um, really get that darkness. But um, we will be lit up in the city when it comes to the eclipse. So, yes. Yes, you sure can. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jerry Robinson. I'm the husband of Mrs. Robinson. <laughs> uh, no teleprompter needed tonight, just a few notes, but I'm not going to go over that now, it's a moot point. My question is, these folks show up on Friday night, because they're Saturday night, Sunday night, and the eclipse is scheduled for Monday morning at 10, 17 a.m., broad daylight. Now you tell me, is that beyond illogical? Why would they want to be there? three days when the event is in broad daylight it's 10 17 a.m. on Monday August 21st mm -hmm. good point am I missing something <laughs> yeah actually yeah. mayor mm -hmm. you can't get a hotel room mm -hmm. that weekend yeah. I mean it's everything is booked you can't get a and it's either. why ever they're why they're showing up I don't know but everybody else is too they expect about 400,000 are going to be coming into this region through here. And so there has been meetings on what are we going to do about emergency services? Because we know what the freeway is like when there's a U of O game and an OSU game. So you can imagine that many people coming to the region. But I did notice that there was people that were in the Madras area because they're right. You know, they're going to be more rural, so it's going to be dark there. Their people are charging 300 bucks a night for their camp, you know, to use their um, yard for camping. So it's, people are kind of looking at it as getting a little bit of Christmas money, I guess, so. <laughs> that weekend well, yeah. is also, is also the Bymark yeah. Festival in Brownsville. Yeah, they're keeping everybody, the next day they're offering people to stay for another event that morning just so they're not out on the freeway that morning. So it's, there's a lot of unknowns right now and it's um, a lot of uncertainty and it's kind of, you know, uncomfortable because we don't know what to expect, you know, out of it. But we probably don't need to be able to, you know, be creating something that could happen in your own neighborhood too and, you know, in our city. So it's best to be a little bit, you know, prudent. So, yeah. Well, I know I'm not the smartest guy, but I just can't grasp why people have to be at a, at a certain location for three days when the event is in broad daylight mm -hmm. and lasts for about mm -hmm. 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes. Two, two minutes. <laughs> Total, well, totality is two The minutes. part that you care about is going to last about 20-some minutes. It's right. the yeah. going up to totality. Once it's total, all it is is dark. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. so you see everything up to it. If you're looking through a lens, you see the, the curve getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and pretty soon it's completely dark exactly. and then it goes the other direction exactly um, but while it's dark you don't get to do anything that's my point sir <laughs> well but it's the time okay. up to it and after it's not just 10 it's like oh gosh 20 minutes well yeah if you're lucky I'm you can look facetious. at it without the glasses and you go blind <laughs> if you're know, not yeah. smart enough 
you know, to get, to get those. I know where you can buy shade 14 lenses. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing, too. They have found when they, they have these eclipses, there's been, you know, some situations where people do get some eye damage, and so there's going to have to be a lot of, you know, medical, you know, community is going to be on guard for that one. But yeah. I, I see your point. You, you don't need two or three days, but... If you think you're, if you live in Portland and think you're going to get up Tuesday morning and yeah, drive down exactly. here to see it, yeah, yeah. there's no chance yeah. that the roads are going to be a nightmare. So that you know, most people probably come a day ahead of time to speed the traffic. ODOTs, you, you're not going to show up Tuesday morning. They'll be, they'll be a day after, late afterwards. <laughs> there's not enough food in Madras to feed everybody. They're bringing in right. coolers. I mean, it's. People have thought of things that you and I wouldn't even think of. That Bill, really can I ask you, where are you going to be during the eclipse? Pardon me? Where are you going to be during the eclipse? <laughs> In my front yard. <laughs> You're going to be checking it out? Yeah. Yeah. I'll be yeah I, I live out by Lynn Benton, and, and I'll be in my front yard. I have one of the lenses that uh, I got from Rich. I, I saw the last one in 78. 70, so was it 78? 78. Yeah. yeah. I was we're living in Central Oregon. 78 or 79. It's cloudy here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, if it's cloudy, I won't see anything. <laughs> well, I didn't read up on Galileo, but I can tell you, I'll be at work inside a Safeway store, and I'll come outside and I'll see it's dark. I'll go, okay, back to work. Yeah, it is dark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's dark. Have, and you'll have all the street lights will come on, too, when it's mm -hmm. dark. So I guess I'll experience it in my own little yeah. world. <laughs> <laughs> That's all yeah. I've got, folks. Thank yeah. you. All right. Thank you so much. So, Okay. Was there any questions, folks? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And we will be looking at our code, too. I think it looks like we need to do a little bit of tweaking of it. So thank you. Um, next on business from the public was um, Joe Such. You had you would like to come forward with a, with a concern. Oh, I don't think he heard me. Joe, yeah. And you'll need to state your name and spell your last name. Furnish your address, please. I'm Joe Such. I live at 340 Maryland. The last name is spelled S-U-C-H. Thank you. And I have a problem. I, I live at 340, and uh, the residence at 330 has uh, the owner died or de he's deceased for about a year and a half. And it, the place has not been taken care of since. So there's quite an accumulation of garbage in the back and the grass is, before this last spring was about four feet high, along with the very vines that's growing. I have some pictures that I'll leave here when I leave. Uh, the rodent problem, my wife has a trap line going in the house in the garage and part of the time in my shop. And sometimes she can catch two mice in one live trap. So I, I have got a lot of problems with this residence. Uh, the ditch in front uh, has been used as a dumping ground. I've got four tires out there that you can't see now. The brush and stuff is growing where it's buried. I have been to every place that I can think of in this town. I just picked these pictures up from a firehouse uh, 13. I have talked to the fireman there. This uh, place is not going to burn right now, but the grass is all green, but it won't stay green for too much longer. So between this house there and my garage is probably at the maximum about 12 feet. And if this place catches fire, I really kind of like to keep my own home. Uh, this is about all I think that I, I don't like complaining. I'm not a very good public speaker. <laughs> so I'm going to leave my pictures. And if you have some questions, I'll try and answer them. Other than that, I, I'm going to leave. <laughs> so, um, so Mr. Such had showed me the pictures, and yes, they were something that our, our, our code enforcement needs to check into. So um, does Sean have, or have you seen it before? Okay, so if you can leave the pictures in with Mary, 
And okay. um, did you have an update on the property, Sean? Or I can give you a little more information on the okay. property. The property currently, the the prior owners, the the owners of record, are deceased. Uh, the what we believe is there is one sibling who has no interest in the property at this point whatsoever and so doesn't want to be involved with it. It's a very odd situation where it, that there is not a, a bank lien on the property. However, the county has foreclosed on the property due to the back property taxes. Unfortunately, the way that works is that if a county forecloses on a piece of property, then there is a two-year right of redemption for someone, the owner or the owner's heir, to come back, pay the taxes, and redeem the property. Uh, we've spoken to the county, and the county, I should say Jessica has spoken to the county, and Chris Schindel, our code enforcement officer, has spoken to the county, and the county does not have any interest in doing anything to the property until that right of redemption period ends, and that right of redemption period ends September of 2018. So we're going to attempt to get creative with some, uh, some ways to hopefully resolve the situation. Um, and we're in discussions with that, and that's something that I may be bringing to you in a work session relatively soon. If so. so if one of those creative things, if it happens to be, is maybe we um, hire a crew to go in, clean it up, and put a lien on the property? Or can you put a lien when it's in foreclosure? Well, the county owns it at this mm -hmm. point. So we'd be leaning a piece of property owned by the county. And, and that's, you know, they clean so it up. that would be, yeah. yeah. They clean it up. Yeah. Just my two cents on this, we had a discussion briefly on it. I, I think I spoke with Chris about it. Um, my recommendation would be to go ahead and clean it up, recognizing that we may not recover our costs on this one. We've had that situation before, even when we've leaned property. Uh, but when it's a nuisance affecting neighboring properties, uh, it seems to me that's not an unreasonable um, cost for all of us to bear um, so that, you know, neighbor, I mean, part of our strategic plan says great neighborhoods. We, we can't have great neighborhoods where we have zombie houses that are, you know, dragging everybody down. So uh, that would be my recommendation to you. I, I know I don't matter anymore, but. <laughs> yes, you do. Yeah. Yeah. For a few weeks. Sean, can the county uh, approach the sibling and have them sign a document? Uh, the county could do a lot of things. The county could clean the property. The county could sign a trespass letter for the Albany Police Department so that they could keep transits out of the house. My understanding is right now the county will not do anything uh, to of assistance. And again, that's coming from uh, Chris Schindel. I have not myself spoken to somebody over there, but apparently they've told Chris that they were not willing to do anything. If I could give my yep. two cents on that. The, the county has said, uh, I've talked to the county administrator about this issue, and they said they can't they don't have the resources to try and get involved in every foreclosed property that they own because it's a countywide issue um, and they're not in the business of you know property maintenance and so they they have just basically written off doing anything well, i wonder if the if our city attorney can get involved and assist them to I mean, if such a document can be produced, and then you don't have to wait till September of next year. We we could do it, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there's yeah. there's some ideas out there that we would we would I would probably approach the council about uh, to see if they were interested in doing. One of the things we've talked about is purchasing the rights of redemption from the the one sibling, and that way we know that that person wouldn't redeem the property later, and the county would know that, and then the city could either clean it up and keep it clean for two years and try to work something with the county to see if they would reimburse it. If not, then maybe talk to the county about purchasing the property for the taxes, take the property, and then they could do whatever they wanted with it. It's certainly assessed it more. It's worth more than what the, the back taxes are <coughs> at this point. I think the back taxes are, last I looked, 29000 and change. So. Is the structure worth saving, or is it a burn? It's project? up for debate. We'd have to get a, a structural person in there to take a look at it. It's not in great condition right now, from my understanding, and uh, it's a small house. It's, it's a big piece of property, uh, but it's a small home. I think it's about a 900-square-foot home. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Marilyn. I could just add that um, those of you who were on the council in 2007 and 8 will remember that this is the property that we cleaned um, with a sheriff's work crew 
and Parks and Rec staff and a number of volunteers when Dan, when Dan Bedor was the mayor. It was a chronic code enforcement problem at the time. The, the uh, people who lived there were hoarders and they had, but the, this is like a third of an acre or a half acre property that was completely overgrown. We took everything down to, to this tall and hauled off, I think it was four 40 yard dumpsters full of stuff. Um, and what and, was her name? What was the name of the partners uh, um, in? Gomans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but what wow. street was it? Is it a Maryland Street Maryland. in Drake. So, the same so we're familiar with this, and we've yeah. invested city money in, in it in the past. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Bridge. Before we jump, okay. let me get with the commissioners mm -hmm. and see if how willing they are to do something. You know, I mean, it's I'm there once a week anyway. Maybe it make me we can use use a little relationship there. If well, just give me the information on it. Right. And that'd be yeah. good, because mm -hmm. actually, if they do sell the property, they're the ones that are going to end up getting yeah. coming out ahead. Well, then they should be, even if we leaned it after the cleanup, they're going to recoup their cost anyway. Yeah. I mean, so, it's, yeah. Give, give me the basic information and uh, the packet on it, and I will reach out to the commissioners on Tuesday. All right, so we will get some more information then for you, but did you have another question? Well, I, I don't know what is owed on the property. I talked to a neighbor that would probably, he'd clean it up, is what he told me last night, if there was a reduction, but he was under the impression there was over $100,000 worth of liens on, on this. Oh, and wow. Mm -hmm. if, if that's so, yeah. my assessment, my property is the same size. The ground is valued at right near fifty thousand uh dollars. Uh-huh. And I've got the piece on the other side of this one that I'd like to have cleaned up also, and its value is the same on that one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so I I don't know. I I don't know what to tell a man. I I cause he, I spoke with him last night, and he says, "Well, he didn't think he could come down here tonight, but." Okay. He, he said he would be willing to clean it up if there was a reduction, and a hundred thousand dollars on that is way too much. There, yeah. There's no way I'm too old wow. to mess with it myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we will staff will be looking into this, so we're glad that you brought it to our attention. So, um, you know, we will get get something moving on this and um, thank you yeah. I, I sure appreciate it i hope you get it taken care of before everything dries up and the potential fires yep. there yep i agree yes so could you leave the photos in with mary too okay, thank you. all right thank you mr such thank you okay we're still under business from the public and brandon um Nietzsche, i think that you were going this to bring an item place. for us that you Somebody had on a report well in while Brandon's coming up i'll give him a, a brief uh, introduction we were really blessed uh about the time that i was uh you know well getting ready for retirement uh it occurred to me that i could do the city a favor by talking about uh, a biennial budget and I was approached by Brandon, who was looking for a, uh, who is an Albany resident, and who was looking for, um, I think it's called like a work experience uh, with a public agency uh, to help fulfill uh, his uh, requirements for a master's degree from P Portland State University. Uh, coincidentally, he also works in the budget office at Western Oregon University. And I thought, wow, here is a great convergence of, of factors. Uh, you know, we could use a, a, somebody taking sort of an objective look at, uh, at a biennial budget process and somebody with some knowledge and understanding of the issue. And so he, he thought that would be a great idea and uh, is here tonight to present what he has found over the last couple of months uh, of doing some research. So, Brendan, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hare, Mayor, members of the council, city staff, and guests. Thank you for allowing me to present to you today. Um, Mr. Hare kind of gave my introduction for me, so uh, I don't have a lot of, to give other than I am a resident of uh, the City of Albany in Ward 1, um, just off of Laura Vista. Um, and I am currently finishing up my uh, Master's in Public Administration at Portland State University, which is what brought me to Mr. Hare's office in the first place, um, to do this organizational experience, is what they call it. So. Um, after conversing with him uh, and kind of doing some of my own research, 
Um, I have this biennial budget proposal for you all today. Uh, as many of you already know, uh, Oregon's local budget law is kind of encased in the Oregon Revised Statutes, Chapter 294.305 uh, to 294.565. Um, it does say that the budget must be adopted before the end of the current budget or before July 1 when the fiscal year begins. Um, and if the budget isn't passed, then there's no expenditure authority for the, for the city. Um, the local budget law also establishes that cities, counties uh, in the state of Oregon can have either a fiscal or a biennial budget process. Additionally, the Albany City Charter uh, and the financial policies adopted under Resolution 6555 uh, outline that Albany is a uh, annual budget city. Um, chapter 14 of the local budget manual uh, for the state of Oregon does say that instead of budget budgeting by fiscal year, the governing body of a municipal corporation may adopt a 24-month or biennial budget. Um, so this is kind of a, a, an idea of uh, the current timeline for the budget process in the city of Albany. Um, there's various kind of staff components to this, I would say, uh, multiple people working on it at different time frames. Um, but a, a general outline is that in December, directors begin kind of compiling their requests. Um, sometime between January and April, the directors are reviewing that with the city manager and uh, staff in the finance department. April and May, uh, the budget is kind of compiled and presented to the budget committee. We've got budget committee meetings and a public review. Uh, and then in June, the budget's adopted by the council. After that point, uh, the finance department is working on rolling out that adopted budget uh, and also working on closing the prior fiscal year. And then September to November, you've got uh, time for annual audits and um, the comprehensive annual financial report. So it doesn't it leave a lot of time. Uh, you start, once you get to November, then you start the cycle again. I'm sure you've all seen this document. This is um, a page from your from your proposed budget that I think you're looking at later this evening. Um, the budget document right now is a 348-page uh, document that at this point is updated annually. So that's a lot of work for staff to go through that every year, find all the little things that need to be adjusted. For the most part, the book probably remains close to the same, but um, you do have to read through it find all the nuances and make those changes. Uh, so the proposal before you today is uh, to move the city to a biennial budget process. So um, I've prepared for you kind of a, a sample timeline of what that might look like. Uh, so in the first year, there's no changes. Uh, the first year being the, the time frame that you're building that budget. Um, so you still have the, the the building of the requests and all the way through the normal process. Where it starts to look a lot better is in that second year. So after the budget's been adopted, um, you get through into the next January. Um, and there isn't a, a, the city staff isn't trying to prepare another budget at that point. Um, what could possibly happen is that there could be kind of a, a budget status presented to the council so that you're all at least informed and kept in the loop as to how things are going and kind of where things are at. Um, but that, that leaves a lot of room for potential projects that the city staff can then kind of turn their attention to. Um, a couple of scenarios uh, in how if the city moved to a biennial budget, there, these would be some of the, the benefits to staff. Um, I know that the city is kind of looking into a new finance system at this point. Um, and so under the current setup, uh, city finance staff has been working on, on budget for, for the last six months. Um, they roll right into the fiscal year end after the budget process and into financial reporting. Um, and then they've only got kind of a couple months where all of them are maybe available to um, begin possibly implementing and training uh, city staff on a new budget system or a new finance system. Under, under a biennial budget, 
uh, everything's the same for the first year. They still have all of that other work, but uh, what they could do is during that second year, they could use the time to um, search, implement, and train city staff on how to use a new finance system. So there's a, a much larger window for everybody to be able to do, to accomplish that work. Additionally, um, public works projects I put on here, uh, there, and I think all of you have a uh, kind of a typed proposal document, and in that it outlines that um, with public works, uh, specifically related to road maintenance, you've got kind of a small window of opportunity in the state of Oregon for when construction projects can occur. Um, a biennial budget, under the current budget system, public works is gets to April and May, and they're waiting for the next fiscal year budget to be approved before they know what kind of projects they'll be able to dive into. With a biennial budget, they'll be able to kind of plan ahead um, and maybe be able to have more projects on the docket faster um, and have just a better idea of what money is available to them for road maintenance and stuff like that across the city. Um, so the, the general idea is that there's a significant amount of human time and energy that's placed into the current budget system. Um, in the budget message prepared by Mr. Hare uh, in this year's proposed budget, he said that a biennial budget will, at the very least, delay the need for more administrative staff as both the community and organization continue to grow. Um, as demands kind of increase, there's the only way to, to help alleviate pressure on city staff is to increase FTE, uh, which does which increase costs or potentially eliminating uh, the commitment of staff to do to work on this annual budget process freeing up some additional time that would allow them to prioritize and kind of plan for those increased demands that, that may be coming down the road uh, lastly switching moving to a biennial budget uh, kind of benefits both the city and the citizens because they get a benefit in the services the level of services that are available to them um, and then it also benefits the city financially by not having to hire necessarily additional FTE. Other benefits to a biennial budget, um, we've got added history for budget documents, which there's another slide that I'll go over in a second that kind of outlines what that might look like. Credit agencies tend to look more favorably on cities that have a biennial budget and a, and a five-year plan. Um, and this information came from a presentation that West Lynn, uh, their finance staff made to their city council when they were considering this same move, um, and as well as the, the Government Finance Officers Association. Um, in Auburn, Arizona, they switched in 2001 to a biennial budget, and what they noticed of this process um, is that they saw enhanced fund balances and better bond ratings for them, for the city. Additionally, it aligns the budget cycle uh, with state budgeting. Specifically, this uh, would be beneficial related to PERS. Um, when, you're, when you're talking PERS increases, it's beneficial to kind of see what the two-year outlook is going to look like for, for those PERS increases and how they might impact city finances. So this just kind of aligns your process with that. Um, lastly, I, I put this in here, uh, the incoming city manager, he's, by, he's very familiar with the biennial budget process because that's what they're currently using. Um, I forget what city. Bottle. Is. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Up in Washington. <laughs> um, so this, this picture is kind of the current history. So uh, I took these numbers directly from the 1718 proposed budget document um, and the the idea here in, a, in an annual budget is the requirement says that you have to have two years of history uh, that are actuals. So we have uh, the 2014-15 fiscal year, 15-16 fiscal year, um, and then you have any revisions to your current year budget and then your proposed. The benefit here is that by switching to a biennial budget, you get a, a, a much bigger picture of kind of the progression of revenues and city expenses. Um, so this I took from multiple documents, kind of going backwards, but you can see that we go all the way back to what's essentially fiscal year 2012. So you actually get to see five years worth of um, 
of historical in finance information, um, as well as the current fiscal year, and then you've got your two years of proposed. I did leave that blank because I don't know what what the second fiscal year right now would look like for you. <laughs> so, um, as with everything, there's always potential negatives to to this proposal. So. Um, a couple of things that I that I came across as I was doing this research is one of the potential negatives is related to revenue stability. So when you start planning even just a couple of years out, um, you run the risk of um, property tax revenue not coming in what you at where you expected it, um, maybe fees for services and, and things like that not coming in exactly as you had hoped for. Um, so the, the general premise is that in the long range, things can change on you. Um, the, the Government Finance Officers Association, or GFOA, proposes uh, establishing a reserve where a percentage of any excess revenue each fiscal year is, is kind of set aside um, for a rainy day purpose. So if, you're, if your revenues do drop, then you have something to fall back on to. Um, another another concern that was brought up is the potential for uh, loss of council control and oversight over the budget. Um, there are some various kind of fixes that you could that you could implement in this process should you choose to move to a biennial budget that might help alleviate some of those concerns. Specifically, um, you could include into the process that the council gets into a budget update annually. Um, I'm not entirely certain if this is done current right now, but I know that at Western Oregon we do uh, quarterly finance reports. And so quarterly reports could be incorporated to keep the council updated on, on current progress and how things are doing. Uh, annual audits would still occur, kind of giving the council uh, another chance to, to review what's happening and where things are. Uh, and then the other thing is the uh, tax rates, even though they cannot change once you've established a biennial budget, once you've adopted it, um, they do still have to be certified annually. So it, it kind of gives you that ability to potentially look into a supplemental budget, uh, like I know that you have done in the past. Um, so none of that, you still have all the flexibility that you would need as a council. So some necessary changes that would need to be done if the council adopted this proposal. Um, first is RS 294.414 uh, says that appointed members for budget committee that prepares a biennial budget shall be appointed for terms of four years. So currently your members, your budget committee members are on three year terms that would need to be adjusted. Um, you would have to update the uh, budget document so that it was two historical budget cycles um, as required by local budget law. Uh, and then summary documents during the transition period. Um, so when you when posted for public review, they have to show both the annual and the biennial information um, while things are kind of getting shifted over to the new process. Uh, and then I just kind of wanted to close with uh, a list of organizations with the biennial budget currently. So on the left we have Oregon cities. Uh, going through all of these city websites, these are the cities that, that have a biennial budget currently. Um, you'll notice SIO on there, they actually implemented a biennial budget this year. So they're in their first, their first round of the biennial budget. And Brandon, if I can interrupt. Sure. I mean, how we could not follow a trend center like Antelope <laughs> is beyond my imagination. I mean, that's, you know, if they're doing it, clearly we need to be doing it. I won't lie, that's one city I well, hadn't heard of when I was going to. turn into Rajneesh oh, Purim and then back. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I know. The old I used to, I used to fish, area. I used to fish <laughs> over there, so I know antelope very well. Well, they, yeah. they got into the red pretty bad there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then some others with using a biennial budget, you've got Benton County, door neighbor, uh, Portland Community College, Twelfth Valley Water District, Clackamas Water, River Water, the Government Finance Officers Association, and I threw in the city of Tacoma and Washington. That's all I have for you. Uh, I can answer, hopefully, most questions that you may have. Otherwise, I may have to lean on, on Mr. Hare and, and Mr. Taylor to kind of help back me up a little bit. Well, this was a great resource. Um, it's wonderful to get this information on it. Did you? Um, happen to find if 
well, I mean, some of the um, cities are quite small, but um, if some of them um, had a supplemental budget sort of more than once during that second year, or did they need to adjust more often than one time? So uh, unfortunately, I didn't really dig a whole lot into that. Um, mm -hmm. For the most part, in some of the research that I was doing, uh, when they were outlining how the council might be able to retain some control over the budget, it, it was considered that, that you'd only really need kind of one opportunity at that um, to, okay. to do a supplemental budget. You wouldn't need a lot of changing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Just to add to it, mm -hmm. there are specific requirements that will you know, relative to supplemental budgets. We've done them for um, years oh, yeah. here. I mean, I think we have a supplemental budget every year. And that's been sort of a tradition here. So I, I don't really see that as a very uh, significant change from current practice um, if, you, if you had a supplemental budget, mm -hmm. either in year one or year two. Mm -hmm. okay, and we do get the monthly financial snapshot. Also. Well, yeah. yeah, you get monthly financial reports. You get daily financial reports that are accessible to you online. You can online. see how much we've spent in every budget line item as of last night, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even as of tonight. I don't know. It, I don't I forget <laughs> what time it posts. Yeah. But yeah. it's, yeah, yeah it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure most of you don't go home, rush home every evening to check and see, you know, how much the police have spent <laughs> on a particular line item. But if you wanted to, you can. Well, the, the donut, the donut fund is awfully low, yeah. I will tell you. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, just a question on your necessary changes if adopted page. Mm -hmm. It says for the budget committee, it says the statute also requires that the terms of service as close to one quarter of the pointies shall end. So, I mean, so you're going to rotate them every... So, so the idea there is, yeah, you would have uh, some new members probably every year. Um, on a, a four-year term, so each year you're going to replace, uh, I forget exactly how many members are on here. Yeah. So you're, you're required to replace some, yeah. a quarter of them well, every... Yeah. Re, reappoint. Reappoint. You can reappoint. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're you appointing it. people in a year that you don't have a budget. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just says that the terms of service shall end. It doesn't say anything about the appointment or reappointment or anything like that. So mm -hmm. there's no way to kick somebody off or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. For the most part, that would follow kind of this, the, the current process and that they could be reappointed. Um, it just Audit says period. that their term yeah. ends. For the most mm -hmm. part? Uh, that's or right. completely? Completely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Except for that little secret thing where we get rid of the ones we don't <laughs> like. It. I don't know. <clears throat> about that. Yes, I see. Yeah. Um, one of the questions, concerns I have is about this rainy day fund. You know, I mean, we have a pretty good contingency on each department as we're going, and I'm just wondering if you, if we have to put aside money, what's that going to take away from uh, staffing or actually, you know, running the different departments? Uh, well, you know, like the state does work very good with their rainy day fund, and I don't know what we would do with it. How how? cities do. Sure. So, so under this proposal, um, this is my take, and, and Mr. Taylor might be able to provide a little bit more here, but um, the idea is that in, you, once you've set your, your budget, um, if in the first year you have, say, 100000 extra dollars and the council has decided we're going to take 10% of that unanticipated additional revenue and set that aside so that in a future year, if your revenues come in low, then you have something to fall back on. It wouldn't, I don't believe, tap into any of the reserves that you may be currently set up for um, any of the departments. Therefore, shouldn't affect any of your your FTEs. Thank you. Want to take it here? So, Mayor, if I could add on that concept a little bit, we have effectively done that over the last ten years while Wes has been here. When I first started with City of Albany. Our contingency account in the general fund was running uh, 10 to 15 percent of balance. And then as the economy tightened, it narrowed down to our minimum by policy is 5 percent, and that's what we were at for a couple of years. Uh, so as the economy grows, we'll start to build that back. And it, that's prudent. If it's done in a one year, it's 5 percent of a one year budget. If it's done over a biennial budget, it's 5 percent of a biennial budget. So it would naturally be bigger. Our target would still be 
consistent with our financial policies, but it would be bigger dollars because the budget is a bigger number for the biennial period. Well, well yeah. Question? Mm -hmm. you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have to put all of it in in any given year. You could, if you were going to do 5%, you could right. do 5% this year and 5% next year to right. make the... And that's our strategy in rebuilding uh, that reserve currently. So in the current year, we've been able to add to that beginning balance and we anticipate being able to in this next year as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, mm -hmm. I, in my opinion, the, the switch to a biennial budget doesn't change the need for having appropriate reserves. Mm -hmm. it, it really, it's the same, whether it's done every year or whether you, you know, you're, you're, you're tip, typically, I think, what, what the accepted standard is in the financial world is usually around 10%. I mean, there are cities that maintain and public agencies that maintain 40, 50% um, uh, reserves. Uh, that, to me, is when you get into the problem that you're discussing, Bessie, of having so much in reserve that you've basically, um, uh, that you're, you're harming your operations of your of your organization plus I don't know how you justify that to your taxpayers yeah you know you're taking more of their money yeah yeah hmm. okay any other questions well this was great information so thank you very much for the opportunity. greatly appreciate you. this yeah so thank you so much Brandon Okay, um, and I think that was it from business from the public. So um, the only other person was Lisa. You didn't have anything, did you? Okay, all right. So now we are going to um, begin our public hearing. So thank you, staff, for um, holding off for over an hour. Sorry about that. So, um, so with that, Mayor, before yeah. we, uh -huh. so what are we going to do with this? Are we oh. going to do anything with it? Are we going to move forward on it? Um, are we going to? Well, actually, we'll probably take it to a work session mm -hmm. and have it discussed then. And then when, you know, Peter comes on board to get, let him get, you know, his feet wet here and get started on it. But yeah, we'll okay. take it to work session. Then all of you can just discuss it then. Mm -hmm. I would think we can include the budget committee on that discussion as well. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. See what they think. So. Okay. Um, so, with that, I'm going to um, open the public hearing at 8.20, say 3 p.m. This is going to be to foregoing a sewer rate increase for fiscal year 27, um, 2017 and 18 and reaffirming rates and resolution number 6549. Does staff have anything on this at first? Yeah. This is on page four, council. Thank you, Dick. Okay. Thank you all for giving me just a couple minutes here. Um, as you saw in your packet, we're, we're recommending that we forego a rate increase uh, for this next fiscal year. But we did want to just touch on a couple highlights of the things we normally discuss with you during our annual rate evaluation and report to council. But I promise I will keep it brief. We'll talk uh, quickly about our rate recommendation. want to review uh, where we're at with our work. Just a quick review of current conditions. want to provide you with an updated forecast uh, when we look forward five years on sewer rates and want to highlight a couple of unfunded needs. So as you know, uh, our rate money is used in three general categories. First, we use rate revenues to cover our debt payments. So we've borrowed money to construct uh, primarily our treatment facilities, and we have annual uh, debt service payment responsibilities that we have to make for that. We also have uh, operation and maintenance expenses related to our treatment plant, our lift stations, and keeping our collection system, collection system operating. So what's ever left after funding those two activities, activities we're able to uh, conduct capital projects with. And it's been about five years ago now where council set a target of $2.7 million in today's dollars that we wanted to build to uh, as, as generating that much revenue annually for capital projects. And that 
target was set based on being able to replace the pipes that we anticipated failing within 10 years before they failed. So pipes that had ex extended their uh, service life and needed to be replaced. The target does not consider capacity needs in the collection system, things like the riverfront interceptor, which you've heard a lot about. It also doesn't address um, potential capital needs at, like, say, the treatment plant to respond to new regulatory requirements or solid <coughs> handling issue that we're discussing. So the, the target and our annual revenue forecasts are based on uh, routine anticipated costs, not one-time large expenditures. So we're, we're in a good position right now, uh, and we're able to meet our o and ex expense requirements and our debt service requirements. We're able to get the amount of capital projects done that we want to get done, and we're able to do that without having to propose uh, a rate increase for this next fiscal year. Looking at where we're at, uh, current conditions, uh, the yellow graph or the larger graph in the back shows uh, the amount of pipe that we have out in the system that's in uh, what we would consider the worst condition, a Category 5 pipe. Uh, the smaller graph in green shows the amount of pipe that we've been replacing over that, that last four-year period. Point here is amount of bad pipe going down, amount of pipe replaced is going up. The lines are trending in the direction that we want them to. We're probably never going to get that back graph down to zero because as soon as we replace one pipe and move it off the list, there's some other pipe moving on to the list. So it's a never-ending process, but this is the, the, the type of pattern that we want to see as far as uh, which way these graphs are going. On the rate side of things, um, for a single family residential customer, a sewer, uh, just their sewer bill, when you compare Albany to 28 other communities in Oregon, we're 10th on the list. But what I think is more meaningful is when you look at utility bills on the whole. So we're talking water, sewer, stormwater, uh, transportation utilities for those communities that have them. You add all those together and you compare us, uh, we're 12th on the list out of those 28. Uh, you see a lot of our neighboring communities are, are higher than us on that list. But what's most interesting to me is that when you look back at 11-12 when we started, the fiscal year 11-12 when we started these discussions, we were sixth on this list. And you may recall back to Diane and then Mark and then now Chris and I saying, you know, we're, we're high on this list because we had to take on a lot of debt to do these major treatment plant projects. And we anticipate that we'll be moving down that list as these other communities are having to invest in their failing <laughs> infrastructure. And while I, don't, I can't tell you that that's for sure the case, but it appears that that's, that that's the case. Uh, and we have continued to move down uh, the list despite creating a new stormwater utility and despite some pretty, pretty substantial uh, sewer rate increases over the last five years in order to build up to this, this capital amount that we've been working towards. So I, I think this is, in, in my mind, it shows that uh, it, it's a positive and, and shows that we're moving in the right direction as far as what we thought we were gonna do. Looking ahead, you know, we, take a, we take a look back at history to try to predict the future there's all kinds of variables in that. These are some of them. But on this graph, showing a little bit of history and, and what we might, might see into the future. And when you look back on the, on the left side of that graph, you see some pretty tough decisions that, that council had to make over the last five years. You have a series of 8% increases followed by a six and then a three. And then you see that the negative there is the adjustment for, for when we put the stormwater utility in place. But you know those, those are pretty substantial rate increases, and um, but fortunately they, we accomplished what we set out to accomplish five years ago, and we've we've met that target. And all things being equal, looking ahead, we're focusing on maintaining where we're at. And when you look out ahead, we have two and a half percent rate increases there. Really, the point is we're looking at main, maintaining to keep in pace with inflation. So maybe it's a quarter of a percent, maybe it's 5%. Who knows what it is? We, we put uh, two and a half there as an estimate. That, of course, assumes that we're maintaining status quo for our program expectations and uh, we don't have any uh, catastrophic failures that we have to address or compliance with new regulations that, that 
make us have to do something that, that might impact grades. But uh, we feel pretty good about what we've been able to accomplish over the last five years and where we're at. And, and we'd really, uh, we really like to focus on maintaining where we're at. And, and we think we can provide that, keep that maintenance even by foregoing an increase this year. So last item is to touch on the un some unfunded needs. Uh, as I said, the one major one you hear a lot about is the Riverfront Interceptor. We've been talking about that for years, uh, as long as I've been working at the City of Albany. Uh, the other item is uh, potential solid tailing improvements at the Water Reclamation Facility. That's, that's still an unknown, something we're working on, as you know, and hopefully that'll work itself out. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there may be other things that come up down the road from regu regu new regulations or um, just pipes that are undersized, lift stations that are undersized that need to be replaced that aren't in that, that rate plan. But what I really want to do is set the stage for some discussions that we'll be having in the coming months with council, uh, particularly the riverfront interceptors. So that's estimated at a, around $13 million project based on uh, today's dollars. And through discussions with Stuart and with others, we've, um, we've got an opportunity that we're excited about that uh, we may be able to uh, pursue a loan from DEQ at a very low and appealing interest rate. And so we're working out the details of that and the intent is to come back to you next month to talk more about the Riverfront Interceptor project why we need to do it, and uh, get a, and we would be seeking approval to just apply for the loan. So a lot more details to come on that in the future, but I wanted to set the stage for it today. The other thing we're looking at is opportunities to refinance our existing sewer debt. And there are still details to be worked out there. Uh, Stuart's been helping us a great deal uh, in evaluating options. and. What we're, we're hoping here, so if everything goes according to plan, uh, we would be able to refinance our existing debt and cover the new debt with that savings. So essentially you'd have no net impact to the sewer utility by taking on the debt for the riverfront interceptor, which means you're not having to cut other planned projects, you're not having to, having to raise rates in order to cover that debt, and we're able to get uh, uh, an important project completed in that. I can't guarantee that at that point. That's what we're shooting for. Uh, you'll hear a lot more about it. Any questions on not doing a rate increase? Any okay, questions, Bessie? And then Jeff. Yeah. Jeff, if we okay, if we don't do any sewer increase, mm -hmm. rate increase, um, you'll go on as you are. Now, if you had the extra money, do we have the staff capability of doing more pipe? Uh, or are we pretty well just going along as we can? I mean, if you had more money, could you do more? I mean, at staff-wise, as far as doing the physical. Sure. Uh, with the types of projects that these are, <coughs> excuse me, we could easily add in, um, you know, another 150,000. If it was 1%, it'd be about $150,000. Uh, you just expand the amount of pipe uh, that we would put out to bid with one of our most of the time is a trenchless technology type thing, so a lining or a pipe bursting. Uh, wouldn't be a big deal to, to add that. Um, and I appreciate, appreciate where you're going, going with that. The one uh, caution I would put out there is that when, when we just implemented the, the new stormwater utility and we met with the industries across town, uh, one of the most I don't know. I don't know that I can name one where I didn't get asked this question. But when we talked about the re the reductions that we were doing to offset what we were moving to stormwater, there was a lot of yeah, buts. But you can just raise the sewer rates, you know, the next month if you want to. Um, and so part of um, not only do I, I not think that there's a, a real driving necessity to do an increase right this right at this time. Um, just wasn't comfortable proposing one given the relatively um, good acceptance we got from the community on the stormwater utility. I mean, nobody wants to pay a new, a new sure, bill, and I'm not saying we also we haven't should. had lines of people on council. Yeah, I'm not saying that we should. I just want to find out if, you know, we're doing what we can now um, and that 
that we're just keeping on a, a, a very good pace as to getting these things fixed. I don't think <laughs> it's a good thing to, to raise the sewer race this year because of the storm water, yeah. you know. But, um, we are, I think, an question. indication of are we doing enough and are we keeping pace is, is uh, five years ago we were getting pretty frequent uh, sewer failures and emergency responses and those types of things and I, I don't know that we've had a major one in the last two years that I can recall. Now so I, I think we're getting it. We were way, we were like right on the cusp of falling off the edge and now we're right ahead, right ahead of the curve. Oh, we want to stay ahead. Okay, great. Thanks, Jim. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, you mentioned briefly our solids handling problem. Um, are we going to be able to solve that problem without raising rates? That'll depend on discussions that are ongoing that mm -hmm. that uh, that we've had. We do have some settlement proceeds uh, that we've that we've been keeping to address that problem. We've also um, got some money in reserve that we've been trying to protect, and, and depending on what we need to do there. If we're able to secure funding for the riverfront interceptor yeah. uh, in another way. <clears throat> That would certainly argue for using some of those reserves uh, on a solids handling solution. Um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that that question will, the answer to that question will work itself out over the next couple months as we have uh, discussions with the various involved parties. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Um, let's see. Is there anyone here that wanted to comment on this item? This is a public hearing item one foregoing a sewer rate increase. Okay. Not seeing anyone with that. Then I will close the public hearing at 8.37 p.m. And Council, you have a resolution on page um, six. And what would you like to do with that? Move to approve. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Just a, a process discussion. Since there is absolutely, I don't perceive a single person from the public, can we do these in mass rather than doing them individually? The, the next ones we're going to do, we'll do that in a big group. Item two, we'll do okay. that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That'll expedite it. So, any any other questions? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. Motion carried. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so next, I will open at 8.38 p.m. the public hearing for adjusting system development charges. Um, this would be items 2, um, um, A through J. And does staff have any comments on this one? Jenny? And this begins on um, page 7. Good evening, Mayor uh, System development charges, SDCs, um, connection charges, in lieu of assessments, they're all in place to make sure that as the community develops, the new development helps pay its share of the cost of services. Each year, these fees and charges are evaluated for a potential increase based on the engineering news record, the ENR magazine, which tracks the cost of construction. The closest index and the one that the city has used historically is the Seattle Regional Index. So as the mayor said before you tonight are 10 resolutions that include an annual fee adjustment based on a one-year change of the Seattle ENR index of 1.11%. The Albany Municipal Code says that the increases are made automatically, however it has been council's tradition to hold a public hearing. Should these adjust adjustments be adopted tonight, they would become effective on July 1st. So there are no new resolutions that you haven't seen before in this packet. There's no expired or um, deleted resolutions like we had last year. And there's no fee ramps to explain. They're just simple, straightforward adjustments this year. And since there's no special circumstances to point out, that concludes my presentation. Okay. Questions of Jenny? Question. Yeah, Rich. I look at the numbers and I don't have heartburn with the numbers if they're, you know. What comes to mind, however, is anytime we are going to raise a fee, we never talk about the, the monetary effect on the person who is having to pay it. Uh, from the perspective, I mean, when you're in business and you sell things, you don't have to have the cheapest price all the time. 
If you give good service, people come to you. But you have to have competitive pricing. I mean, you know, you, you come to me and I say, a cylinder of oxygen is $10. Uh, when the guy across town is, is charging three, you know, that's a big deal. If, if he's 950 and I'm 10, well, they say, how come? And I better have a good reason. Have we gone through the expense, and it's not just these, it's for the entire system. I have a need for a house, and I'm going to look at various places I can live, and I can buy a piece of property that's however big the normal place is, and I'm going to put a standard size house on it. Uh, what are my fees here compared to what are they in Lebanon, in Corvallis, in, you know, is that information, do we actually do that calculation? <clears throat> or is it, well, gee, uh, people from Corvallis who come over here smile when they come because we're so much better, quote unquote. And people from Lebanon say, gee, why are you stabbing me? Or whatever it is, from wherever. Um, is it anecdotal or is it, is it, do we have real numbers? We have many times have had comparison, you know, mm -hmm. charts of what our SDCs are up against well, other communities throughout the state. I'm talking about yeah. not just what the water is or the other. Uh -huh. I mean, if you add everything together, if everything that we require versus everything they require, are mm -hmm. we competitive? And, and yeah, and I think we are. And I think, um, you know, we have good data that can back that up. Um, we also have um, the visible evidence, you know, it's like, uh, well, I was, this is a related topic. I was asked a question last year by the newspaper about, well, how do you know that care is working? And of course, we have numbers and data that we can turn to to show increases in assessed value. But I said, you know, go out and look with your own eyes. And I actually conducted a tour with Kyle from the, the paper, and we just went out and looked. If you look at Albany in terms of are we attracting our share of new development, the answer is yeah. We're, we're now, we're seeing, you know, building permits for residences and commercial are way up. And uh, so if you're thinking in terms of, as a business, am I competitive? Well, the first question you ask is are people choosing to invest here? Invest in my business, you know, in, in whatever it is that I'm, I'm peddling. From my perspective, yeah. I find out what they're paying at the other guy mm -hmm. and what they're paying from me. Yeah. Um, I really want to know if it's a, you know, pick a number, mm -hmm. size house, size business, size something, what would the fees be? And right. I would think that the various okay. other agencies, other places, would want to know that for themselves. The um, building division has a whole cubicle wall covered with that data, so it's it's right there. If you'd like to see it, we can get it for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, yeah. and as you say, Rich, I mean, on a on a on a item by item basis, every time we we redo a, a fee, we do a, a comparison. Well, a holistic. Yeah. What does it cost me to build a house? Building division right. has that for. I mean, there's city after city yeah. after city. Right. Antelope was even on the list. Yeah. I looked at it today. <laughs> but you know, I don't care what the water SDC is or the storm SDC. You know, you add them all together. I don't really care what that is as long as people have enough money to buy it. I care whether or not we're out of bounds, and I would like to have that information. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. Yep. Yeah, we've had those comparisons um, many times, but it is, and it's very good to actually have, say, even on our website, put up one of those comparable charts, and just the same as, um, you know what you did show on the sewer rates too yeah. is always good to put on the website to show where where we're at with our, within the cities in our region where we are lower on those um, those rates. So well, I mean a yeah a listing of a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar house. Mm -hmm. I'll get you something. Yep. You Look at that. Mm -hmm. But but it's kind of good to get out there yeah. too on the website. I think yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, any other questions, staff? over this would be for A through J. With that, is there anyone here that would like to comment on these items? This is A through J. Seeing any? With that, then I will close the public hearing at 8.45 p.m. So, Council, you have um, a resolution that's on page 15, 25, 27, 35, 36, 38, 40, 41, 45, and 46. 
move, move the resolution. Resolution. Okay. Oh, resolution. Okay. All right. Um, I heard two motions there, so is that? One's a motion, one's a second. Yeah. <laughs> I think Bessie made a motion, Ray, Ray second then. And that would be all those resolutions. Oh, yes. Did you get the numbers, Mary? Okay. Um, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. You can handle it, Rich. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Now we have a public hearing that'll open up at 8:46 p.m. This is for setting fees and charges for development code provisions and repealing resolution number 6516. And I see Bob coming forward. And this would be on page 49. Thank you, Mayor, uh, City Council. Um, it has been a council's practice to adjust uh, planning division fees based on the year-to-year -year, um, increase in the April CPIW index. And uh, the April 2017 uh, CPIW index is 2.14% greater than it was um, last year in 2016 of April. And so simply based on that increase, staff is recommending a corresponding increase to planning division fees. Um, and, and that's spelled out in, uh, in your packet. The other thing I wanted to, to note this evening is um, the additional changes to the fee schedule. Um, the one I just want to just highlight is the, the, the fees related to floodplain permits for land divisions. Those changes are proposed to reflect some changes that the council approved last year for the development code in terms of review processes for, um, for smaller subdivisions within floodplain. And uh, essentially what this does is um, it brings the fee schedule into alignment with those process changes of the development code and results in a, or it would reduce the floodplain development permit fee for those um, subdivisions of 19 lots or less that happen to be within a floodplain. So uh, that's uh, my presentation. I have to answer any questions. Question. Have. Sure. Mm -hmm. Rich. We're using two different systems for one's the Seattle and one's this. How come? The Seattle construction cost index is related to construction cost of uh, infrastructure, it's a building or infrastructure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, the permit fees and the relation to the CPIW, it's it's cost of it's living, staff and, yeah. and personnel costs. And so there's two different indexes for two different types of activities, and that's why the two different ones are used. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the the other another issue too, Rich, is that with the the um, um, SDCs, those are they're regulated by state law, and our goal there is cost recovery, you know, trying to cover the actual cost of doing it. The council has made a conscious decision over the years to not try to do, uh, to recover the costs of uh, planning activities, for example. So we subsidize what at this rate of about 85 percent I think was a, I've seen more. it yeah I think it depends on how you look at it but um, mm -hmm. if in terms of the, the total expenditures it's in the range of 15 to 20 percent if you're looking at certain application types we do much better mm -hmm. others are, are recovering very little so kind of on the whole yeah we're, we're doing okay but it's a conscious decision to yeah we are not recover. we are not attempting to recover all our costs yeah. with planning well. fees I was just, what, yeah. we got two different systems, just wanted to align. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Mike? Um, who publishes the CPIW? Is that published by the government? Yeah, federal government. So then the question is, is what if it goes down by 5%? Do we reduce our uh, SDCs so by well, 5%? I, I think that would be a, a question the council could consider and, and could, could potentially Have do we that. ever done that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. We, we we had at least one year of reduction back when the, the CPI actually went down. Mm -hmm. so. I, I, I will say, too, that um, between 2016 and 2014, uh, there, there was no proposed um, increase in fees. So this is the first time since 2014 that we'll actually, uh, if, if your decision is to do that, would, that they would be raised. And we're only raising it because the CPIW says it went up by 2.14%. Yeah, 
That's correct. There was a policy decision made in 2000 by the City Council to increase fees annually based on the April CPIW um, index, and so we've been sort of following that that process um, since then. Has has our costs gone up by 2.14 percent? Probably more. Dramatically <laughs> more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, just again, the cost of processing applications, the cost of new rules that have been imposed, I think even since 2000 on notice requirements, things of that nature uh, are well in excess, which is why we've actually, I think, I think we had a presentation here by a previous community development director several years ago, which showed the how little we were recovering in the actual costs of doing planning and development, um, you know, relative to our fees. So, you know, the council has the, the discretion to make a decision and say, okay, well, gee, we want to we want to increase the subsidy, the tax subsidy, if you will, to um, to planning and development activities, uh, or you have the discretion to say, no, we want to uh, put more of that burden on people who are doing developments. It's mm -hmm. it's a council decision. Right, and when that pr presentation was done, that was by Greg Byrne, and I remember it, at that point it was nine, eleven percent recovery. So you had 89% that our property taxes were backfilling for pretty much every new house to be built, all new development. So property taxes are subsidizing that new development. So it is, it totally is not a good balance, but um, it's never, it's always been council's direction of how much to be able to recover over those costs on that. Okay, any other questions? Okay, um, I don't see anyone here that would be wanting to come talk about this item unless there is someone. No? Okay, so at 8.53 p.m. I will close the public hearing. And um, Council, you have a resolution on page 49. Move to adopt. Okay, second. And there's a second, and any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. Motion carried. All right, and then now at the same time, 8.53 p.m., I will open the public hearing for adopting of our capital improvement program. So, you're already here, Jeff. Okay. Great. Good. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, before you tonight is the resolution to adopt the 2018 to 2022 capital improvement program. After the April, work, or April 4th joint work session, the CIP final draft was made available for public review in May. One public comment was received this year and was provided in your council packet tonight. Uh, the result of this process is the resolution that is before you for adoption. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, questions? Okay, is there anyone here that would like to comment on our CIP program? Not seeing anyone, I will close the public hearing at 8.54 p.m. Boy, you did a fast public hearing, <laughs> didn't you? Okay, and council, there's a resolution on page 54. Move to adopt. Okay. Second. And there's a second. Any more discussion? And this is, just for if anybody is watching, this is a document that kind of lays out our five-year sort of plan and um, for funded projects and unfunded projects. Um, and we do go through an evening of meetings over the projects with our budget committee and planning commission also with the city council. We should have a okay. four-year or a six-year plan. Yeah. <laughs> the Soviet Union always had five-year plans. Oh. <laughs> okay, any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. Um, next public hearing is, <clears throat> this one's for 5A and B. This is for the um, opportunity to comment on proposed uses of state revenue sharing. I will open the public hearing at 8.55 p.m. And Stuart. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. This is the second opportunity for the City Council to receive public comment regarding the proposed uses of state revenue sharing in the proposed budget. Uh, the first opportunity was provided in the first budget committee meeting when the city manager proposed the budget for next year, the 2017-18 budget. Um, following the received, following the 
Com the public hearing and comments that could be received, the City Council has two actions to consider. One is to declare our eligibility to receive state revenue sharing, and the second would be expressing our desire to receive state revenue sharing. In the proposed budget, the use of state revenue sharing is in support of the transit system. And with that, if there are questions, I'd be happy to respond. Questions? Okay. Is there anyone here that would like to comment on these um, proposed uses of state revenue sharing? Not seeing anyone. I'll close the public hearing at 8.56 p.m. So, Council, you have two resolutions. One's on page 56 and one's on page 57. Um, one is we, the eligibility to receive state revenues and the other one's the election to receive state revenues. Move to adopt. Both. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. Motion carried. All right. Thank you, Stuart. And next, I will open the public hearing at 8.57 p.m. And this is for our annual budget. So this is adopt adopting the City of Albany 2017-2018 annual budget. Um, this is the one that we've had 10 hours of meetings of reviewing our annual budget. So, Stuart? And thing? that would be about the sum of my report. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the Budget Committee has received the proposed budget from the City Manager uh, as put together by City staff and all the operating departments that had opportunity for review with the entire Budget Committee, which consists of the City Council plus uh, seven lane members that uh, had opportunity, as you mentioned, over three nights uh, to review and receive input from directors of the different departments regarding what's being proposed in the budget. Uh, the Budget Committee uh, approved the budget that was proposed by the City Manager and it's now available for, has been available for public comment and the public hearing tonight is to receive additional comment after which the City Council would be invited to adopt the budget for next year. Okay. Questions? And also, if anybody is interested in watching those 10 hours, I do believe that was videotaped, wasn't it, that yes. night? So that is on our website. Nice. So, yeah. Okay. Um, anybody that would like to comment on our annual budget? Okay. Not seeing anyone. Well, I will uh, close the public hearing at. Oh. Yeah, just just to comment, yeah. I'm uh, I'm obviously going to vote for the budget, but I'd still like to just be on record of saying I think we need to have more money in equipment reserves. Okay. All right. Okay, I will close the public hearing at 8.59 p.m. And there's a resolution on page 59. Move for the adoption of the resolution. Second. Okay, and discussion. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. All right, thank you, Stuart. Um, okay, we already did business from the public, and um, with that, on, let's see, page 64, we have a second reading of ordinance. Sean? An ordinance amending section 5.08.025 of the Albany Municipal Code, establishing regulations for all medical marijuana businesses and facilities in the City of Albany and declaring an emergency. Move to adopt the resolution. Second. Ordinance, excuse me. <laughs> We've had a lot of resolutions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah ordinance, yeah. Here's the okay. Do we want to adopt the ordinance? All right. Any discussion? Yes, Your Honor. Yeah, Dick? Yeah, I'd like to comment that a, uh, uh, a couple of my constituents would very much like to use their property for uh, the uh, growing and uh, perhaps processing of uh, marijuana. And if we reject this ordinance, they might be able to do it. So I would encourage the members of the council to vote no on this, on this ordinance. Well, there's probably, if you have <coughs> checked at all with Lynn County, there is massive acreage and acreage that has been established for marijuana grows. So I think there's plentiful in our region. So well, and well, as that's, the that's paper said outside. this morning, <coughs> Uh, there is the feds are being invited in. Pardon me. The feds are being invited in by the state of Oregon to head off the feds coming in and 
hitting us with hammers and claws over the fact that because there is so much extra marijuana being grown in Oregon and it is being transported outside uh, against federal law and against the coal letter that there is the possibility that the feds will come in and in fact enforce at the behest of the state of Oregon. And much of that, if not most of it, is black market marijuana. It doesn't matter. It does matter. If the state and we add on to the pile on to the state and make it so difficult that people cannot grow, process, or sell marijuana, it drives it into the black market. Well, so I think it's we my are understanding remiss. the black market. I think we are remiss in piling on to the state and trying to prevent the uh, marijuana business in our city. All right, we have a motion and a second. So, that anything else? I'll question. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Okay. I hear one no. So, Mary, five to one. Okay, thank you folks. Ordinance is passed. Next, um, Council, you have adoption of the consent calendar. There is quite a few items on there, so if there isn't any that needs to be pulled off, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. Okay, motion's been made and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. All right, now we are up to page 107. And this is authorizing a contract. This is for solar panels um, on three of our fire stations, which the contract is on page 108. Um, staff, Jorge. Yeah, you any questions? Good? No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, Chief Brenner and I went over this contract with Sean. This is the contract that um, uh, council gave us direction to move forward to drafting after the presentation back in May in a work session where uh, the company PGPV is uh, offering to install a solar panel system on three of the fire stations. So fire station 12 will have a 33 kilowatt uh, system, fire t station 13 will have a 33 kilowatt system, and then fire station uh, 14 will have a 50 to 53 kilowatt system. And the contract outlines the duties and responsibilities of both the city and uh, the contractor on how these services will be delivered. We've also included a termination clause that says that for any reason the city may terminate this within 60 days and uh, direct the, uh, well, the, the company to remove them within 30 days. This contract also says that after uh, nine years, uh, the, solar, the solar panel systems will become property of the city of Albany. For a dollar. Payment of a dollar. One dollar per each system, so yeah. three dollars, yeah. Okay. Any questions? Was that a motion? Um, what was a motion? Right. We'll do it. Okay. Okay. All right. Was there a second? A second. Okay. All right. Mike, did you have a question? I don't know how to phrase it, but I'm going to do the best I can. <laughs> He's, this company is going to put solar panels on three fire stations for nothing except the, repay, the uh, monies that it's going to get back from the electric company on the, on the, on the use of the uh, electricity, correct? Yes, the way it, it works mm -hmm. is that the solar, comp the, the solar panel will generate uh, electric power, it will be okay. sent back to, through a meter, sent back to right. the electric I understand company. that. Yeah, okay. The solar panels cost money. Yes. It's $250,000 approximately. The, the approximately. Yeah. So he, we're paying 250000 for these? Zero. Or he's yeah. giving us. He's giving us. He's giving them to the city right. to produce electricity that he will get payments for over nine years. And that, he gets a that's what I'm so understanding. Gets, what happens is he's going to place these solar panels. He's going to sell the electricity to us at 10% less than what we get from, according to Schedule 33, okay. 20. So that 10% is where he's going to get his money. Mm -hmm. Plus the subsidy from Uncle Sam. Yeah, plus the, the subsidy. Correct. He gets a lot. So of the question is, mm -hmm. has any other solar provider been offered this opportunity? 
Well, are we the, sole the question is, we're sole sourcing this to one company because he came no. and, and asked. He's and the only one that offered it. We haven't okay. had any other offers. Okay. So he's the only one offered. Are we, are we sole sourcing this to one person, one company, because they offered? Does that mean that anybody can come and say, I'm going to do this for you, but if you pay me this, I'll give you the equipment? I mean, it's the same thing. And we're putting it on top of, I have city, the city buildings, and it, the, but I, also it was running out for this. Um, oh, I understand it. I understand too. it's yeah. running out. I understand that. I'm just saying mm -hmm. that we're giving this contract to one individual, one company, without asking anybody else if they want to do it. And he, if he's putting this on for two hundred fifty thousand dollars, I guarantee you it's not out of the kindness of his heart. Okay, but we haven't so seen anybody he's, else. But he's going to make money off of that, and he we've given him the opportunity to do that because he's approached the city. Is there any legal, Sean? Is there any legal thing there that says that uh, basically it's sole sourced? We sole sourced this? No. There's, it, it this, I mean, this, I'm trying to think of an analogy when you were asking that question, and it would be like an analogy if, if someone wanted to give the city five utility trucks and put magnets on those trucks, and they give the trucks to the city f to use for free for 10 years, and after 10 years they'll give them to the city for a dollar, but in the mean, on those 10 years the city will have a magnet on the truck advertising their business. Um, Which, by the way, you can do. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but, but that would, I mean, so the city wouldn't go out and then make an RFP and say, does anybody else want to give us nicer Freezing trucks or free or, or let sell them for less than a dollar at the end of the, at the, that yeah. time? Um, well, so in this case, we were approached, and I understand, my understanding from, from staff is we weren't approached by anybody else. I don't know that anyone else actually is doing this. Do anybody we're else not purchasing anything? anything. Yeah, it, we're buying. not. We're not buying we're not anything. purchasing anything. Right. Yeah. At the end of the time, we're given the opportunity to purchase, purchase if we want. For a dollar. For a dollar per system. But we're, per we're purchasing the electricity from him at a price less rate. than we're currently paying. Understood. Yeah. It's a savings for the city overall. Yeah. And I see where you're coming from. The, we're, we can offer the opportunity to others, but none others have come to us mm -hmm. offering the same opportunity. Yeah. Right. And I, I definitely and understand what Mike's saying. Yeah. I, I, do what, I, I get what he's saying now. So, yeah, but we, yeah, we went through a work session, and now we prioritize this packet, and no one has approached or protested. Right. Mm -hmm. So are you saying if someone else came and, and made us a better offer, then we might take that offer? If somebody not else came with a better offer, we're not going to take the system off now. But if it was within the process, we'll bring it to City Council well, mm -hmm. to evaluate. That's, but we have a lot of buildings that we could we have put many them others on. Right. We I mean, it's not, like, it's not like it because this guy gets it, someone else can't. Yeah, and a little history with this, too, Mike, that might help a, a bit. We actually have had proposals over the years from other places. Uh, to do solar arrays, and we actually, Bob Woods, who was uh, sort of our uh, analyst on that subject, had evaluated those previous proposals, and they just didn't pencil out. Uh, they didn't produce much savings for the city, and um, uh, they were on existing buildings, and uh, there was one specific proposal for here at City Hall that would have involved penetrating the membrane on the roof, which we thought was a bad idea, and so we opted not to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, we get offers of, you know, s you know people pr wanting to provide services at different times, and, uh, you know, we'll evaluate them. Uh, you know, we don't always go through a competitive process on everything we do because it would be expensive, time-consuming, and, uh, you know, probably pointless in a lot of different circumstances. Uh, my understanding with the deal that we're getting now is that it's sort of, this is toward the end of an opportunity for this particular provider, and so he's able, he's, he's making a better deal than what we could have gotten if we had chosen to accept it at an earlier time. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Well, I, I voiced my concerns uh, at, the, at the work session. I can see that the language in the actual agreement uh, pretty much indemnifies the city from, you name it, upside down, backwards. Mm -hmm. It still doesn't mitigate my concerns that what happens if all of a sudden he disappears and goes out of business where we left we'll keep them we'll keep it, yeah, we, we keep the we keep the equipment 
Pardon? He ha we, we could terminate the contract with 60 day notice and then he has 30 days to remove the equipment. If he does not remove it within 30 days, it becomes property of the city. So that's how, we, and, and unless it was a, a liability at that point for some reason, and then we'd have to remove it. But I, I just don't perceive that the, that the benefits outweigh the potential risks. And, and, and because of that, I'm going to vote no on it. So uh, it'll still pass. But. And just maybe to kind of go back on what uh, Councilor Sykes was asking about is this company doesn't have exclusive rights to put them on any building in the city. It, so if, it, like Jorge said, if another company came along and said they wanted to put them on uh, City library, Hall or yeah. the library or something, and we in the city wanted to do that, they could do that. So, mm -hmm. in my understanding, there's very few out there that even do this, too. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. There's a motion and a second. Any more discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Aye. Yeah, let's do a roll call. So is that no on Ray and no on Mike? Mike, I Thank think you. so. The two. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Motion carried. Okay. Um, next council is, this is on page 116. It's the intergovernmental agreement with Wayne County for capital improvements at the expo. And, Wes, are you leading on this one? Or? Uh, no, Jorge, I think, has actually Jorge been is, okay. our lead on that as well. Yeah. All right. This is the uh, draft that was requested to uh, be brought back to City Council for uh, being able to, it was part of, it's actually in the budget to provide the county with $100,000 for capital uh, projects that were, were intended to promote tourism uh, within the city. And as you see here, we've added a couple uh, items in the agreement. The last one that I added after this was reviewed in a, in a work session was letter E in the agreement, where county agrees to provide the city on or before uh, June 30th of 2018 a list of capital improvement projects that were completed with these funds as a validation where these funds were utilized. Um, I contacted Randy, uh, the director of the Expo Center, mm -hmm. and today I met with uh, the group that meets the recipients and providers of TLT at the council chamber. Rhonda was there as well. Um, where I question the list here that they have, because they have in maintenance something right. like four stalls, which might be a capital project, improvement project. Uh, it's not the maintenance. They already have all, and they're not replacing those. Yeah, but that was an issue. Capital project can be defined as new or maintaining infrastructure. Well, that's why it's, that's my biggest uh, yeah. heartburn. It says maintenance. It doesn't. It's got yeah. capital improvement under total ninety three thousand dollars, and the county's going to. And so there's going to yeah. be two hundred thousand dollars coming in to do ninety three thousand dollars worth of work. But, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. One of the things I think is the way they display this this list, where they have chairs and tables as capital improvement does not provide a good picture of what capital improvements are. But there might be some capital improvements that are classified as maintenance, like this horse stalls could be, um, or others. Uh, but the, the, the summary of this is that they will need to provide a list of projects that qualify uh, as capital improvement and supporting tourism uh, for these dollars. And then council has the decision to next year not provide this service well, again. So you'll be coming back to us. They'll be, they're gonna have to come back to us with with a list, it's not this. They're not asking us to contribute just it's, off of what they have down here. This is the list they provided me when I asked. Well, mm. um, this was it. And this is a recent request I made. Yeah. Right. Okay. The only thing I see here that really enhances the expo and is not the routine maintenance really is just expo hall dividers. No. So that's something that they just use the curtains up. I can see them, you know, being an asset to have those um, dividers up, but the rest of it looks like a lot of maintenance, yeah. but Rich? I've talked to the commissioners about this, and the commissioners agree that it's not maintenance things. Uh, it should be things that make us, uh, that make the place more valuable to, for someone to come. Right. Mm -hmm. And so from that perspective, um, E, I don't know, I, I think it needs reworded to say 
that they will bring a list of things for us to basically choose. That's item A. Um, mm -hmm. that, you know, that, but we have the... It says to be used for capital improvements, period. Nothing about yeah. tourism or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. So, yeah. No, so. that they bring to us a list of items that we choose from. Mm -hmm. That these, 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 these are the ones that are okay. When I spoke to Roger about it before, it was, he agreed, in fact, the horse stalls were a maintenance item because they're not getting more horse stalls. They're just yeah. replacing what's there. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. That's why I didn't see anything that really makes well, the expo more sellable. There, that there is would bring electrification of, of the parking lot for, for um, they have at various points um, van uh, RV shows, uh, and they can get some big ones if they do that. Um, but they didn't have that on here. Yeah, there is. It is. Where was it? It's the list on the right-hand side. Where is it? Upgrade of the HVAC. Which no. pictures are you going to heat? Oh, the light, uh, the light power in the Northwest lot. Okay. Where? Oh, power. Right hand north. side. The second. Second bottom. from the bottom. Oh, power. But they didn't put a price down. Right. Yeah. It's. Yeah. That's. But that's one area. The capital right. improvement. Infra it's infrastructure. Capital improvement infrastructure yeah. is what is what the commissioners agreed to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not maintenance. One of the things that uh, Rhonda that works at the Expo Center said that, you know, I'm going back to the horse stalls because it's something that came up in the TLT committee and they actually brought it up today again, uh, the, the recipients and receivers, is that they lost one show because horse stalls went up to par. They lost one uh, in the last couple months and they're, they may lose another one uh, because the horse stalls are not ready. So they're going to be going out for some grants to get some money, but they don't have all the money there. Mm -hmm. And this, these dollars could be used for that as well. So was it ever brought to how much actually motel rooms are for the horse shows? Because a lot of the horse shows, they usually stay oh. in their RVs on those horse yeah. shows. Yeah, well, Leah was there, and she was in agreement that this could be a good use so they can rent more rooms. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep, but that's, that, see, that's not... That's that, maintenance. That, that's maintenance. That's yeah. not capital improvement. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They've got to come back to us with a list of well, capital improvement things. So, I agree. I think so. I mean, does the council think you'd rather see more of a detailed list of capital improvements? Well, well I, 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 I don't think we need to have a the list today. Mm -hmm. I think what we need to have is the idea that says this is capital improvement that makes it a better place to be, not maintenance. Well, I'd like to see a list before I give them money. Yeah. Well, yeah, and they would give us a list, and we'd say these things work. So, is heating the bleachers is that going to be a big improvement? It could be. I mean, it is. Where, where do people heat the bleachers? Then? We're we're talking. No, you heat the people in the bleachers. You do it with infrared. <laughs> can, I, can I make a suggestion based on what I'm hearing from all of what you're saying? Yes, please. Is is that? Jorge and I, or Jorge can go back to the county and say, hey, look, we want a better list, yeah. <laughs> that we need more choices, mm -hmm. and that the We count need E to be changed. Okay, and E to be changed, and that you bring that back at the next council meeting. But that doesn't affect the agreement. The agreement is, we can update the agreement with the changes I need. The mm -hmm. agreement is something that we are agreeing to work with them, and then we can right. say the list, until they provide the list, we don't provide any That's money. right. Yeah. But we can close this, you know, if we get approval, from the council to make that change and take this agreement to, to the county. And that's the first step. We finish that task, and then we won't provide any dollars until they provide the list that we share with the council. But, right. but we agree to. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Have it brought back. Yeah. So we might okay. reject some of the things that they. Right. Of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe get it down to 50,000. Yeah. 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 Good idea. Ooh. Okay. All right. So, oh, Jorge, you'll follow up on that. Well, well, I think Corey is asking to approve. Yeah. The, I would I would approve it based on the change. Based on the change that says that they will bring us a list that we choose from. To uh, that we how do you you, know, you need to wordsmith it, but mm -hmm. that we choose from the list that they bring us items um, that we okay for 
for inclusion. I mean, it's not, they don't bring it to us afterwards and say, we did this something that you didn't approve, it's we approve it first. Is there any reason why that couldn't be done at the next meeting? I mean, yeah. the whole package? List and What's new agreement. <laughs> the only thing is, I don't know if the county will be ready to provide a list. Uh, well, so well, too bad. The list, the list. They don't get money until they give us oh, a list. Yeah. So we can, So the wordsmithing is is all that needs done. Yeah. To get the idea. And we can do that at the next council. Or yeah. So let me let me see if I capture uh, letter E, which says county will will provide a list of projects that council can agree. Agree on that our capital improvement projects, something like that. Mutually mm -hmm. agree upon. Yeah. Yeah. Mutually agree upon. Yeah. 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 Or we, just as a suggestion, we could add it as a, or we can just shift it down and make a new B that would say something to the effect of county agrees to provide a list of capital improvements slash infrastructure items to the city that, you know, will we'll wordsmith that the money will be, you know, used for. Prior to us really giving the money out, so right, and then, yeah, that works. Did that capture so, that? Okay. Right. Yeah, I can, I can put something over. We, so we'll first of all, now. I thought we already adopted this. Uh -huh. We didn't. No, we brought it to a work session. Well, we, well, we and just it wasn't that week's it. council meeting that we adopted it. Then. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, why don't you just bring back a revised okay. version? Okay. Then. I'll work with okay. Sean. Because we, version. we've already, it's yeah. in the budget. And we've already adopted the budget. Right. Yeah, I kept so the money's there the given yeah. a willingness of them to come up with a project that does the right thing for us. Okay, so this will come back to us a revised version of the agreement. Table for words, okay, okay. Madam Mayor. Yeah. Yep, just yeah. Jesse. So, do we do it like we do the CARA projects where they have to whatever they whatever we say that they're going to do that will help fund they bring back the receipts and then we then they get the money i mean because I I really it if it's a project that we agree to there is a number for it i mean we pay up to mm -hmm. I know. half yeah. up to a hundred thousand uh dollars -huh. that or a number of projects then I they're going to have to really the, narrow down that list so it well, would, yeah. it, it's a good point. So then it, they could say, well, we estimate something is at 200. We kick in the 100, they kick in the 100, but then maybe after they go out for bids or they fund a project, maybe they get it for 175. So well, I, yeah, we I see pay, where you're coming, point, then we could have had less. Mm -hmm. That's not yeah. what the agreement says. Yeah. The agreement says we're going to give them 100 grand. In the middle mm -hmm. at, and at the same time, the county's going to put 100 grand in the same account. Yeah. It, there's nothing in there about paying for as they submit invoices or paying for half of a project we're just giving them a hundred grand yeah i mean it's right there in the agreement it's a it's and b it's i'll be able to if i could make a, a suggestion for which i have no stake <laughs> but which i think would make a lot of sense if you're entering into an intergovernmental agreement with another agency where you've agreed to provide them a hundred thousand dollars in funds to upgrade the Expo Center. I think if you build into it the kind of administrative costs and oversight that you have on a care loan where you're giving money to a private individual, mm -hmm. you're, yeah. you're kind of, I mean, you're detracting, I think, from uh, the purpose that you're trying to achieve. And, uh, you know, there's got to be some level of trust. I mean, there are, the county's an audited organization. You know where their money's going. If you're going to give them 100000 give them 100000 Particularly if you're telling them what they can spend it on, yeah, you know they've got to prove that they spend it on these things, right. and they're the, your your carrot for them, your your accountability that you're interested in yeah. comes in the fact that if they don't do what you ask, you're not going to give them the money next year. Uh, it's, there's nothing in here about an annual contribution. Uh, well, no, 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 it's not. It, and there you go. So if they want to, if they want to see the continuing support from the city of Albany, they're going to have to justify it. Yeah, well, if they need yeah. our support, why don't they come and well, tell us? <laughs> this is a separate issue now. Yeah. You've already, in my judgment, you already made the decision a while back that you were going to give them the hundred thousand, and now you're just haggling over the conditions. And so. Uh, unless you want to completely revisit that debate and say we don't want to give them the money I would say don't attach so many strings to it that you make it difficult for both parties 
Just my two cents. Let's just wordsmith it and bring it back. Yeah, and then we can we can check it out. Yeah. But yeah, I'm kind of with Bill. It's like we haven't They're not agreed on an annual thing or anything, and so it might not be feasible that we do it. So. Okay. I think okay. that's a good All right, idea. this item will come back to you, Council. Okay. Um, next is business from the Council. Oh. And Bessie, anything this evening? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay, Are Bill? I will not be present for the uh, CARA meeting next Wednesday. Oh, next week. Mm -hmm. okay. So if somebody can okay. take care of the uh, chair yeah. in the ARA meeting. Mm -hmm. Who's co chair? I am. Richard. Oh, okay. okay. That was it. Thank you. Uh -huh. okay. uh, yeah, I uh, hear on the news that uh, people in Michigan are holding the people responsible who decided that they weren't going to treat their water appropriately and uh, being charged with manslaughter. And I am so glad that we are able to hire good people to run our city facilities. And thank you very much for doing it. I just can't imagine what the people in Michigan were thinking when they allowed that kind of thing to happen to Michigan. I agree. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Could be okay. All right. Is that it? Yeah, that's okay. It. Rich? <clears throat> Actually, I don't think I have anything. Mm -hmm. what, or maybe I do. Mm -hmm. I, I did pay, did I tell you about paying $44 to give my dog fleas? That's all over the internet. Yeah. It's a trending story. A trending story. Okay. Well, then I won't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that was about. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll tell you when we're done. Okay. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Is that it? Ray? Mm -hmm. Welcome back. You had a nice trip to Sweden. I had a, I had a week's vacation in Sweden. Got those. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, scratch that off my bucket list. If you, we did one thing that was the bucket list item. If you have not done so, um, I went. My wife and I went first class all the way. Wow. Um, that is an experience on the overseas flights where you get, you're in your own little pod, and you have a full bed. They give you. Uh, pajamas, duvet. Uh, oh my they, I mean, it's it's an amazing experience. It's, it's, that's how the other side lives. So we we're 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 telling you too much. I was yeah. just going to say we yeah. need to talk Jeez. about that council stuff. <laughs> oh my god, hundred and eighty bucks that's a month great. is just. It, it was an amazing experience. Which and the food, the presentation they give. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, it's the front end. It's the whole front end of the seven forty seven. All the windows you see from the door when you walk up into the door. Nice. Everything to the left there is the first class. Well, so you, everybody has two windows. They have electronic shades that go up and down. I mean, yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. And <laughs> so you weren't able to see anybody drag bleeding from the plane. <laughs> by the plane. <laughs> That's no, united. I did. I did. To your point, I did. Man, I did walk <laughs> back to where geez. some of our friends went, went, went with, and you go from first. You go into business class. And you pass the last curtain, and you're like nine rows across of people just like cattle. Wow. <laughs> and, saying, and you're laughing at them. I know. I'm with my camera. I'm turn, I turned around and took a picture of them and walked back up through to see how it changed as you go back up through it. Uh, I'll have I'll, I'm sorting and organizing pictures. I'll have it available for folks that want to. Oh, yeah. Don't ask how much it was. It. I mean, Ray, Ray, what airline was it? British Airways. Okay. It wasn't United. <laughs> well, it wow. actually ended up with Alaska to oh, okay. Delta to British Air. I mean, that was all they have, these co-op agreements and stuff. So and how many hours flight? Uh, it's actually about a nine and a half hour flight from mm -hmm. uh, Heathrow to Seattle. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. So did you go to the Saab manufacturer at all? Or? Oh, yeah. They're, they're no longer in existence yeah. uh, anymore. But that was the... Uh, uh, 10th anniversary of the last time we were there. So yeah, it was it was a good deal. Oh my gosh, that's great. Yeah. So glad you had a great time. Yeah. You, Mike? Okay. Anything else? Right. Okay, Mike. Anything? Negative on that red rabbit. Okay. Well, I have a few things, Council. So um, um, first is I know a lot of you have been hearing about um, parking for the carousel. That when it opens up. And people been saying to us that we should have had the parking ahead of time before the carousel was built. 
but we always knew how do you know how much parking we need until it is built. So, um, and then also I guarantee if we built and had a parking garage before the carousel, then people would probably criticize us well, because people said we, the carousel would never get off the ground. So <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, because they never thought the carousel go. So, you know, I, I've stated to people, too, that have had the concerns that we can be able to do some stuff in the interim, you know, to be able to really assess in a few months what will we need actually for parking so we can plan, you know, for the future. So um, in talking with um, Carousel's management, they're really concerned. They want to make sure they get these folks there. So um, I had mentioned, and I had um, mentioned it to, to Ed Hodden, and he's checking to see if the staff's available, but to have the trolley mm -hmm. for about a month to be able to move people from parking lots to the carousel. One staging area could be Bryant's Park. People could park at Bryant's Park, the, car the tro trolley could go back and forth, or we could see about um, using other parking lots, like say Safeway's parking lot or not. So Ed will um, gather to see you know what that cost is. We do already have TLT funds appropriated for the um, for the trolley, and he'll see if they've got the staffing to be able to do that. But they will um, also connect with the carousel folks and try to work out something on that. So I just kind of wanted to give you a heads up on that. And then if you hear from people about the parking, you can just say we are working on coming up with you know being able to move the folks um, you know folks around um, when it comes. Because um, it's just, it's unknown what we will need. Um, they are planning on July 25th, but it's not, it's still tentative. They won't know till next month would be the grand opening. And that would be, um, they expect maybe a thousand people will be there for that grand opening on that. So we're going to be needing to trolley folks in and out of there. But um, so that's it on the trolley. Um, also, the um, duck launching day will be June 29th, so it's at noon at Waverly. So I hope all of you can make it. And Is Dr. Come? Duck gonna come. What's that? Is Dr. Duck gonna come? From um, I'm trying to find Ray's trying to find his email. I I want to formally invite him. I um, spent today inviting the folks to make sure the painters were there, the donors, um, you know, Mike Briggs' wife, Pam. Um, and the, the larger donor who donated money for the ducks. So we're going to have a little event out there. I don't know if anybody's seen on my Facebook page the actual complete duck after we got it painted. Um, it's gorgeous. He's a very handsome duck. So <laughs> oh, I'm, yeah. I'm just I'm proud of that duck the way it came out. Very colorful, very vibrant, and this is actually matches the theme of Albany. If you think about it, you come off the freeway and you've got this colorful, colorful, vibrant duck, and that's matching the theme of our carousel with very beautiful, <laughs> vibrant animals. So you're, you're going to be beaver. impressed, I think, once them. you see that duck, yeah. how it's painted. But, but those artists, man, they just went right through and just, you know, got those colors on and it was, it was fun. So, um, and so put that on your calendar. It's on June 29th. Next is, um, I've been just drives me when I crazy when I go through town and the amount of weeds that I'm seeing on our arterials and our major collector streets, some of them in the center medium, some of them that are just covering curbs. Um, last year they sort of got out of hand, never, do, never did really get caught up. A lot of it is ODOTs right away, um, and they, they don't have the funds to maintain them. So, um, you know. It, it's something kind of the routine maintenance for with parks and with streets, but um, um, Ed was I asked Ed how much it would cost additional um, and if we could be able to you know get some additional funds to look at for parks to be able to maintain it, but they figured contracting it out would probably be around seventeen thousand dollars to. Um, be able to get it contracted out and do it a couple times, you know, through the year to be able to keep up on it. So he's going to come back with more solid numbers on that because some of that's really street, some of that's park. So <clears throat> it's the council interested in, in being able to get some additional um, funds going towards this type of maintenance. I look at 
an attractive community is what's um, really going to be bring the tourism in and the visitors. If we don't keep an attractive community, that's just going to affect us overall on our, our tourism. Mm -hmm. And um, and I guarantee you can go down any street and pro probably see many weeds that's been taking place. Can we get a map of which specific streets you're talking I, about? I think so, pretty much. Easy. If you if you think about what we've got on. Um, you know, Pacific Boulevard, Sandy Am, if you can see there's 34th, there's coming in off the freeway. Um, but the more, the more you I add bet in, you, the every more one of you can tell me. Be. So, yeah. we, I mean, which ones, I mean, we've got to define that for the scope of the project. Right, and I can have, I can have Ed and John Goldman come up to see which ones they think would, would be best, but. Um, Alternatively? Yeah, what's that? Alternatively? Mm-hmm. Could we put out a request to local business that says, would you please, while you're taking care of your place, would you go on out to the curb, please? Um, and just see if, if they will step up. Because it doesn't hurt. I mean, I know a lot of places, they, you know, the propane place, he'll go out there and do it. That's not a question. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just, if people are asked, they might step up. Well, and, and they might thumb their nose at us. I don't know. Right. And really, a lot of the businesses do. A lot of this is areas that have, and Dick can relate to it, it's you've got the, you have got the fence along the sidewalk. The setback. And, um, and it's in the backyards of homes, and nobody maintains those. And we have a lot of that throughout the, the community. And the grass just gets thicker and thicker each year between that fence and the sidewalk, that little strip of land. So who's gonna who's gonna get out there and cut it? So somebody might if they were asked. So well, if it <laughs> could, yeah, I mean on, on, when it's property owners and it's like homes, the back sure. end of homes. So yeah. There there's many. I welcome I oh. welcome you to go out and ask ranch. <laughs> no, I mean I mean, I mean that we them. ask the public via via the City bridges. City bridges via the paper. Email. Media. Um, You're optimistic. More optimistic than I am that that would happen. So. Well, if but, you don't do yeah. it, there's 100% chance it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I'm well, just, I'm yeah. just, I'm just mm -hmm. spitballing here. Uh -huh. Okay. ADC Albany Development Code has codes on grasses and everything else. Even though it's along the right of way for the state highways, and it's their responsibility, and they don't have the money to do it. And the Albany Development Code says if the grass is over 10 inches, we can go cut it, correct, and then send them the bill. Well, if it's over 10 inches and it's in the state right away, send them the bill. They're, if we violate their laws, they fine us. So is it reasonable to think that <coughs> if they violate an Albany Development Code, we can, we can send them a bill? We are doing that. We are? In some cases, yes. Do they pay anything back? Do they pay it? We're, we haven't we haven't done any abatement yet. We we just sent out the initial letters two weeks ago. The first period, the first 14 day warning period is up, and now we're figuring out what the worst of the worst is before we start abating when people haven't taken care of it. And we're starting with the stuff that's six feet tall, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. working and our way see. down. There is and we lot. have some that are that are six feet tall. Mm -hmm. And have we gotten money back from the state in the past? We have never done this with the state before. Well, We've always asked it. them to do it, and they've done it themselves. And I'll have to say to Rich's idea of asking the businesses to do it, that has been my dream as long as I have been here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I made a, a request of local businesses like that um, 18 years ago, and it was rebuffed. Mm -hmm. But well, maybe yeah. things have changed. And I think yeah. one of the problems, if and Rich is right. If if it's a homeowner, mm -hmm. you do it once, you'll do it forever. They'll never do it. They'll say, "Well, yep. it's bad enough. City will take care of it eventually." Mm -hmm. So I like Mike's idea. Well, Mr. Homeowner, you can do it, or we can do it. You're going to pay one way yeah, or we'll another. For it. We now That's have it. the authority to do that and do it year round. And for that, we thank you profoundly for making mm -hmm. that change in the code mm -hmm. because we can do that now. Well, one, one piece is you've got our beautiful train station that's nice and groomed. You know, around the curb and gutter, all the weeds are out. But you look to the left, 
the state just mows, but do they clean? I mean, do they get rid of all the weeds that are coming between the curb and the no. sidewalk and the gutter? So then it just looks like a mess. Same thing on Ellsworth is by Central School. You know, it's just mowed around, light posts and all that. I remember last year, you couldn't see from 9th Street down to Pacific a curb. It was covered with weeds all over. How many more years do we keep, you know, having that happen? How are we going to get a better handle on it? So I'm all open for ideas, but other words, do we just keep letting our community kind of be blighted with weeds? So without being well, a little bit more proactive. If we will make a request, why don't... Uh, say let's talk to the chamber of commerce um, tell me to talk to the chamber of commerce i'll talk to the chamber of commerce and see if they'll put it down there in their blast good well, luck with that but it's not so much the oh, business i don't have a problem talking to them it, it i is, didn't either yeah <laughs> a lot of it's public right of -ways. it's more of well, just the public no. right of -ways. no well, if you if you have a business and it looks rasty in front of your business you need to clean it up Right, but that's Great. to me minimal compared to the public right of ways. That is not in front of a business. A lot of it is just transportation sections, you know, of, uh, public right of ways to, on, on the street system. There's no bordering business on that. So, how are we going to get those maintained better? Uh, you take a D8. <laughs> oh, no, I guess maybe not. Five with the ripper crazy. You and take the tree you know, and sink the ripper. No, mm -hmm. let's not go there. So, if, so let's like, say if Long Waverly, say there's a fence that has a five foot setback. Now, is yeah. that the city's property right away or whatever? Still the city. Mm -hmm. Or because I know I was told once that, well, yeah, you have this sidewalk and then you have that, so you would need to take care of it. But I don't know if people realize that they need to take care. You know, some do. They have a front. Usually they do when you see their, you know, the front of their house or something face yeah, the street. But this is this is backyards. They've got it fenced. They never go back there, and we've got that throughout the city, and um, and it just makes it look very blighted. Yeah, it's poor planning. It was poor planning. It's always Dick's big issue is not walling off the fencing off the the community on a street all you see is a wall of fence but this yeah. is a, a selfish okay. suggestion on my <laughs> part but it, it, you know it's a ed is aware of it and is doing some some research uh, it would seem like this would be a subject for a good subject for a work session i, I mean so we too. do have some new tools now as marilyn pointed out to go after some of the worst violators on big weeds but I don't think they address some of the concerns that the mayor's brought up and uh, you know Ed can come back and give you some estimates of what it might you know what a more intense uh, management uh, yeah. grooming if you will of the right-of-way would look like mm -hmm. and uh, I know. think it'd be worth it yeah mm -hmm. so let's, let's we'll, yeah. we'll alert him that he needs to do that yeah good great I think that'd be wonderful so thank you so okay um, next I have is um, everyone this is Wes's last City Council meeting well, so because he on, is man. not going to be at the next one where's um, the whiskey I know so yeah for that. <laughs> which it's yeah it's to me very sad Wes is leaving he's just been so such a fantastic city manager we are going to greatly miss you I don't want people if anybody's watching this we are going to be doing a, a send-off to Wes for a, a retirement, um, you know, reception for him in a couple weeks. So this is not just your send-off. <laughs> right. No, I'm very grateful. We will be really coming after you in a couple weeks when it comes to your reception. So. <laughs> and we're just not going to kick you out the door. Well. Just beware. <laughs> yeah, beware. So. Nope, I appreciate it. It's been yeah. great, great 12 years, and I'm very grateful to the council all the council members yeah. that I've worked with over the years. So it's, uh, it's been a pleasure doing it. I can't believe um, those years. I will say after yeah. hearing Ray's story of traveling in style, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I've am gonna. i got a long airplane flight coming up. I think it's 30 some hours uh, in July. And uh, I, it was a bucket list item. You gotta do it once. Yeah, well, I think I'm gonna be tied to the tail of the plane I'm on, so, <laughs> so I'm not, not quite that lucky. But 
Yeah. Thank you. It's been, it's well, at least we're kind of keeping you later than sort of normal for your last one to be getting yeah. close yeah. to 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Get a hamburger. It's more <laughs> yeah, um, but at least it wasn't that 1 a.m. that we had. So. Okay, um, that's it. Did you have anything? No. Okay, staff have anything? Staff? Okay. Um, with that, that our next meeting would be June 26th, and our reg for work session, our regular session would be June 28th. We have Kara next week, and um, and then on June 29th is going to be Wes's re uh, retirement reception. Okay, with that, we're adjourned. Thank you.